Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you are. Welcome to the special session of the 2020 GCEP Global Virtual Forum, promoting SSE through public policies, seven case studies, and guidelines for local governments that is co-organized by United Cities and Local Governments, or UCLG, Global Social Economy Forum, or GCEP, and United Nations Research Institute for Social Development or UNRIST. I'm Il Chang Yi, Senior Research Coordinator at UNRIST, and I will moderate this session. Today, uh, we are going to present outputs of the UNRIST project promoting SSE through uh, public policies, guidelines for local governments funded by and partnered with GSEP. There are seven case studies and one guidelines for local governments. This session is a three and a half hour long session, but there will be two breaks after first three presentations on three case studies and Q&A, and after second four presentations of four city case studies and Q&A. For smooth facilitation of this online forum, Please mute your microphone and if it is possible, turn off your camera too when you are not speaking. And if you have any questions or any urgent issues, please send your messages via chat window. Or you can also raise your hand virtually. If you want to raise your hand, please look for the participants button in Zoom and click this icon. And then look for the raise hand icon in the middle of the menu. If you click this, we will notify you have raised your hand. And if you finish your intervention, click your raise hand icon again to change it to lower hand symbol to avoid confusion. For your information, this session is simultaneously translated into three languages, French, Spanish, and English. If you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can find interpretation symbol. Clicking the symbol, you will see the symbol of languages. And this session is going to be recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, you can let us know. We will edit the clips in which you are featured. Then without further ado, I will call upon speakers who are going to deliver opening speeches. Firstly, I would like to call upon Sarah Fallier uh, of United Cities and Local Governments. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for some. Okay. So, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Yi, and also thanks to Lawrence and Arum uh, from the GSF. The GSF has been building now for a couple of years uh, a lot of uh, awareness inside UCLG on the concept of so social and solidarity economy. And it is a very supported concept by our leaders which uh, are, is a really vast communities of local government, their associations and their mayors. And maybe in our understanding in UCLG, we have a twofold understanding. First, the local solidarity for inclusive development and also global solidarity for a sustainable and peaceful planet. So both approaches are interconnected through the same people, through the local authorities, the councillors, the mayors that work with them in the different places. So our expectation from UCLG of the session today is learning from the lessons of local government that applied concrete policies to strengthen the social solidarity economy. And I would like to congratulate the study so far. We have been in, uh, looking into it and it is a really promising research you are applying. So for the seven cities that are studied because they have developed policies, program and institution, the projects should allow to reflect on their own innovation and sustainability and highlight their good practices internationally. And for a broader community, as a UCLG community, the project, project should provide key elements to identify, plan and support their SSE ecosystem. This is a longer endeavor that may require more steps, 
like this uh, webinar, but more exchange, more peer learning, more knowledge management and policy debate. And we are open to this, but it definitely seems a big opportunity and a very big priority to connect and motivate cooperation. We run through an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented challenge. The COVID-19 is marking a new time and local government suffer losses and stress. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we listen to our leaders. They are facing the crisis, working with their community, motivated by the spirit of solidarity. So this spirit, what we can say, the intention for policy making is a starting point and it is shared and followed by who and what we need to do. In these months and years to come, the how also need to be shared. Do you hear me? For yes, yes, very clearly. Good. So for this, uh, we hope that the examples, the policies, the proceeding, the financing, the regulations or the deregulations uh, can be learning lessons and provide insight about successes and failures. The local government should not only be a, a, um, uh, the only target the, uh, of this guide which uh, you are preparing, because often their influence on international in, on institutional environment is limited, in particular in local economy. It is true, and the empirical in analyze of the study provides evidence that the holistic approach of the local government is a way is their way of working. But how many local governments support SSE without having a clear competences and in particular fiscal means to do this? So we should not confine, uh, co-find the approach. The COVID already confines our body, bodies, but not the thoughts. Actually in, U in UCLG, we have been revisiting the policy priorities with our, our leaders and COVID-19 helped us to sharpen our vision for the future. So based on a very broad life learning consultation beyond the outbreak with our leaders and partners, and I will give you the link uh, later in the chat, we summarized the vision in a decalogue, which you can find in, um, in our web and, and social media. It is not a given that basic services are public services. It is not a given we have a multilateral system. It is not a given we have a financial autonomy, local democracy. All this requires value. All this requires solidarity. The partnership that we have around the World Urban Forum and on local economic development, the LED Forum, is an opportunity for further articulation. And we welcome your involvement in the roadmap towards the forum event in May two, uh, 2021. And we are very happy also that we have here a colleague of the UNDP Art, who is also a, a key actor in the forum. We dedicated many live learning sessions uh, also to local economic development. So this is a top priority of the cities that are facing the pandemic, which is destroying millions and millions of jobs. So we learned that SSE, uh, Social Solidarity Economy, can strengthen and inform the efforts of many local governments supporting small and medium-sized and household entrepreneurship. The cooperatives can empower in particular women. And we would like to stress this point uh, also to be taken up with more emphasis in your research. The dialogues between private and public sector on development based on the territories, uh, territory are taking place. The pandemic can be a turning point for a new way to measure, to, to measure economy, for a new basis of productivity and well-being. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be here with you and also with my colleague Juan Carlos uh, Uribe, who is joining also from uh, UCLG Learning Department, which I have the honor to uh, coordinate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, our next speaker is Andrea Agostinucci, Local Economic Advisor for the UNDP Art Initiative. Andrea Agostinucci, the floor is yours. Okay, then good afternoon for us in, in from Rome in particular. And good morning, good evening, I guess good night also for some of you in different parts of the world. 
And, uh, and really to begin, many thanks really to GSF and UNRIST colleagues for this opportunity to address a few words in the opening of this session. I think it is dedicated to a very relevant and important work in a very critical, I believe, um, research area. Just to quickly start with, uh, with, uh, with the context, as, as we all know, um, we are in the middle of a, of a quite unprecedented global crisis that is forcing us to think and to act differently. Uh, it is important that we start adopting transformative approaches that facilitate a transition to more just, more resilient and sustainable societies. Uh, we believe that territories are key to this endeavor and that sustainable development goals are more than ever relevant to frame it. It is crucial, therefore, to build stronger, renewed alliances and strategies for enabling the effective implementation of the SDGs, starting from the local level and cutting across multi-level governance frameworks. Now, alternative economic models like the social and solidarity economy have an immense potential as catalysts of the transformative territorial processes that are much needed for bridging recovery with a just transition under an umbrella of effective SDGs localization processes and frameworks. Indeed, the potential of SSC is rooted in its nature as an inherently local, multi-actor and multi-dimensional processes that allows addressing social and environmental problems through resources, capacities and relations that are embedded in localities and that are unlocked through collective intelligence and democratic self-management. SSC can help creating economic value while addressing societal needs turning communities, labor, cohesion, and well-being into key factors for economic development, a connecting offer and demand of core goods and services as part of integrated and localized circuits of production and consumption. Moreover, SSE actors and organizations are showing a strong deal of resilience in the face of the crisis and an even stronger capacity to tackle some of its consequences, becoming kind of champions of a new development model that is at the intersection of economic efficiency, resilience, equity, and eco ecological balance. Now, to actually leverage this full transformative potential of SSC, it is crucial, absolutely crucial, to entrench it in societal and governance processes and to mainstream it in national and subnational policies. National frameworks, in this sense, legal and policy frameworks, are crucial preconditions, but are not sufficient ones to establish conducive environments for SSE to thrive in its natural setting, which is, at the end of the day, communities at the local and territorial levels. More specific conditions and mechanisms are therefore needed and must be established at the local level to enable a stronger SSE sector and a more effective response to the challenges that it seeks to address. This, again, in turn, requires a systemic approach that fully connects and integrates SSE with the key drivers or the key building blocks of local development and local economic development processes in particular. And this can refer to policy and decision making, governance mechanisms, support services and funding, information, data management, research, innovation, capacity building, communication, marketing, and the like. In turn, again, specifically in today's situation, this entails and requires that local and cities governments conceive and adopt SSC as a key dimension of comprehensive response strategies to rebuild local economies on different grounds, and not only, as it is still often the case, as residual or transitory solutions to specific problems. As UNDP, as you might know, we lead the social economic component of the global UN recovery effort to the COVID crisis. In this framework, we've produced more than 100 social economic assessments. Most of them point to the local level as a key entry point for enacting effective rehabilitation strategies. And more specifically, as UNDP Art Initiative, we work at channeling effective recovery solutions at the local level under an overall SDGs localization framework. This obviously includes promoting the vital role and potential of SSC. And we do that in our capacity as members of the UN Task Force for Social and, so on Social and Solidarity Com Economy, as co-organizers of the World Forum on Local Economic Development that was mentioned by Sarah, alongside UCLG and other partners and gradually integrating an SAC perspective and component as part of our country level efforts, uh, specifically programs on uh, local governance, local development, local economic development, and SDGs localization. Previous editions of the World AD Forum have highlighted the huge potential of combining SSC as part of local policies and systems for SDGs implementation. 
And I think that today this nexus between SSC and local systems acquires an even stronger relevance as a driver of transformative response strategies that are centered in territories. To conclude, on this basis, we highly value this innovative work by ANRIS and GSF, in particular, the elaboration of a guideline for local authorities in a crucial, but I believe still rather unexplored area for public policy making applied to local ecosystems. This could constitute a very valuable input for UNDP work and specifically country level programming. And we stand ready to continue discussions that, by the way, we've already started with colleagues of GSF and Andres in the framework of the task force and beyond to develop concrete synergies in this area and specifically possibly applying the findings of this research on the ground. Thank you so much again. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, you know, if you speak very fast, I mean, interpreters would have problem in translating your variable contribution into other languages. So all those participants are recommended to speak slowly um, to be very kind to interpreters, please. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to call upon Lawrence Kwok, Secretary General of GSEP, as a speaker to deliver opening remarks. Lawrence, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Welcome to this special thematic section on promoting social solidarity economy through public policies, seven case studies and guidelines for local government co-organized by the UNIS, GSEF, and UCLG held on the very first day of the 2020 GSEF Global Virtual Forum on Great Challenges, Greater Solidarity, Power of Community, and Social Solidarity Economy as a Path for Transformation, which has just inaugurated with more than 870 people connected from 102 countries. Actually, there are more than 2,000 people registered for our forum. It's, a, it's a really a big, big success. I'm very honored to address this opening remark on behalf of GSEF and also UCLG Community of Practice on the Social Solidarity Economy to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to the team of eminent researchers from seven cities and countries who have responded with their expertise, interest, dedication, and passion to this very important and ambitious research project. My special thanks and gratitude also go to the UNIS team, in particular, Dr. Il Chang Lee, Senior Research Coordinator, and Samuel Buruliso, Research Analyst at UNIS, who have coordinated this research project for the past two years and have been working with the GSEF Secretariat to make this section a reality for today. I also want to express my very special thanks to Sarah Hofflich with her team of UCLG Learning Department, Pablo Fernandez, Juan Carlos Uribe Vega. We all know that the role of the UCLG is very important to accompany local government around the world who are increasingly interested to promote social solidarity economy public policies to respond to the growing need of its citizens for an inclusive and sustainable development for all. I also thank to Andrea Agostinucci, Local Economic Development Advisor for the UNDP Art, with whom we have been working for the World Local Economic Development Forum, and also recently exploring the perspective for future collaboration to better use and diffuse these guidelines for local government that would greatly help to recognize social solidarity economy's role and potential by decision and policy makers to better elevate the current social economic crisis and as a strategy to promote sustainable and inclusive development. It is important to note that interest in social solidarity economy has risen sharply in recent years, especially in times of great crisis, such as the global financial crisis of 2008 to nine, and currently in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. As the search for an alternative to current social economic system has become an urgent task, for police makers and local and national government, social solidarity economy is seen as a possible alternative strategy to drive transformation needed and as a strategic means to implement the sustainable development goals in a more cost-effective and synergetic manner. 
I believe that UN Task Force for Social Solid Economy, as well as the key international networks such uh, of the social solid economy, such as the RIPES, International Forum of Social Solid Economy, and GSEF, have also contributed a lot for this growing visibility and the global recognition of the role and potential of the social solid economy. However, I would like to acknowledge today in a very special way the great and important contribution made by researchers who have engaged to deepen understanding of social solid economy by making practices and actions of social solid economy to be interpreted in the language of police making and also be measured in terms of great political and social impact for local, national and international police circles for its critical role in transforming social and economic relations and systems. Some of most representative of them are present today for this section. So I take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to them for their contribution by raising the visibility of social solid economy as a strategy to achieve social and economic transformation needed for our society and especially to contextualize and achieve the social uh, sustainable development goals at the local level, which is the primary reason for the production of this research outcome. I sincerely hope that today's section will greatly contribute for the greater awareness about the role of social solid economy in facilitating inclusive and sustainable development, insufficiently recognized by decision makers and by government both at national and local levels. I'm excited to listen to our eminent speakers today to learn about their strategies and visions on how to help our government to better promote social solid economy public policies and mainstream social solid economy into the national and global development agendas. Let's listen to them and learn on how we can better work with our government to build co-constructed public policies to the social solid economy as part for transformation to face great challenges together with greater solidarity. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Now we will go into the discussion on the project and its outputs. Firstly, I will uh, briefly introduce the project itself. For the sake of time management, we prepared pre-recorded presentation on mine. Here it goes, Samuel. Morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. I'm Will Chang Yi, Senior Research Coordinator at UNRIST. Today, I'm going to talk about UNRIST project promoting FSE through public policies, guidelines for local government. Um, on behalf of UNRIST SSE project team, including Samir Alfred Brueli Sauer, Carmen Chada, Hamish Jenkins, and me. SSE research in UNRIST started with the project Potential and Limits of Social and Solidarity Economy in 2012. Since then, we have had around seven research projects and three key international events, including Potential and Limits of Social and Solidarity Economy uh, Conference in 2013 and uh, UN Task Force Conference on Implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, What Role for Social and Solidarity Economy in 2019. And the project we are going to talk about today, Promoting SSE Through Public Policies, is one of the latest projects. With these projects and key events, Ernest has contributed uh, to mainstreaming SSE within and beyond the UN system. This guidelines project has kind of four pillars which became the basis of this project. Um, first one is interview with policymakers of selected national and local governments to identify policy needs and demands. Based on this interview and extensive 
literature review, we could establish policy and institutional framework of SSE ecosystem and selected um, cities for case studies. Uh, we got seven case studies on cities, including Barcelona, Dakar, Durban, Liverpool, Mexico City, Seoul, and Montreal. And lastly, the guidelines itself, uh, which became one of the major outputs of this project. This guidelines has 10 chapters, including introduction, explaining the bolts and nuts of SSC ecosystem, and the substance of individual chapters will be explained by my colleague Hamish Jenkins in his presentation. This guidelines has four distinctive features. The first one is it has been written uh, from the perspective of policymakers who are willing to promote SSEOEs in their own local areas. And for these uh, policymakers, it has been written uh, in plain and simple languages, uh, which convey the messages or information about SSE to policymakers who are trying to establish policy and institutional frameworks and uh, programs for SSE. And as I mentioned, it is uh, composed of 10 chapters dealing with bolts and nuts of SSE ecosystem. And every chapter has a guidance section which has flowchart system of question and answers which will guide users to relevant information. As you can see in guidance section, which you can find in every chapter, you can find a series of questions and users do not have to worry about getting answers right because the uh, whole idea behind these questions is to help users to uh, find the relevant information to their research concerns or policy concerns and interests. And we recommend um, you know, multi-stakeholder uh, group exercises, which can facilitate discussions between stakeholders and policymakers for policy making and institution making for SSE. We are thinking about follow-up activities as well. And obviously, we are going to disseminate findings and lessons of seven case studies. And we are going to engage with training and education courses uh, with these guidelines for local governments. And we are planning to elaborate this guideline uh, to possibly produce guidelines uh, version 2.0 based on the feedback from the users. And if uh, funding is available, uh, we can launch a new project, Guidelines for National Government, which is going to be national version of these guidelines for uh, policies to promote SSE. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, I give thanks to myself. <laughs> and, and as I mentioned in the introduction of the project, we have produced seven excellent case studies and their authors are with us today. In the first subsession, we'll discuss the cases of Seoul, Mexico City, and Durban. We will first go for the Seoul case study. Kilsun and Sangyun, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sangyun Lee. Can I share my slide by myself, or Sam will share from me? I don't know exactly. I will share it. Sorry, one second. I think I can share if you. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Sang Yun Lee. I'm from Seoul, South Korea. I'm working at Songgonghae University. I'm very happy to share and like, contribute to uh, uh, I mean, the case of the UN LISD project. Uh, thank you so much again. Next. 
Uh, as you know, this presentation is based on my working paper with my co-author, Gilsun Yoon. Um, next. Uh, my talks divide two parts. First, I briefly explain the situation of a social economy in South Korea, and then I uh, will jump to Seoul's case, and and then I uh, will level up with uh, my thoughts. Next. Next. Uh, as you can see here, uh, I mean the inequality level in South Korea is quite high. Uh, Ten jebels, I mean big conglomerates, uh, consist of 40% of total GDP in South Korea, which leads to the discussion of a social economy, I think. Next. Uh, however, I think there is no universal concept about uh, social economy as well as the scope of a social economy. But anyway, uh, so far in 2020, two bills are proposed uh, and under review uh, before going to National uh, Assembly. Uh, two bills uh, are quite similar and uh, it defines uh, the social economy economy, as you can see here, uh, is quite a general concept, as we may know quite well. Next. Two bills have the common uh, organization, which is the 13th organization for social and solidarity enterprises, including uh, cooperatives and social enterprises and community enterprises and other uh, uh, cooperatives as well. Next. But this bill is not like uh, 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 built alone, actually. Uh, before this bill, uh, I think so Ulls, uh, all this is, is uh, quite functioned well to uh, propose the national bills for social economy. As you can see here, uh, so government enact um, uh, various uh, legal actions. Next. As a result, uh, this is not like the statistics of Seoul, but in general, uh, the statistics about social and sol solidarity enterprises in South Korea, as you can see here, uh, is uh, the end of uh, 2018, um, were more than like um, 20,000 uh, um, enterprises exist and uh, more than, it's almost like th three, 300,000 workers uh, work uh, in the, this sector. Next. Uh, these four uh, enterprises are main target by policy uh, at the national level. Uh, next. This is actually uh, originated uh, from, I think, uh, the Ministry of Employment and Labor's Master Plan for Human Resource Development for Social Economy. Um, so actually, uh, the, the Korean Social Enterprise Promotion Agency uh, run this program and many uh, young entrepreneurs for social economy actually um, propose their idea to get funds. Next. Uh, now we discuss more deeply about Seoul's case. Next. As you can see here in 2020, uh, more than 4,000 cooperatives existed only in Seoul as of uh, September 2020. Um, mainly, uh, the cooperatives are main a type of enterprises. Uh, uh, next. Uh, this uh, uh, result is not uh, is uh, originated by the public and private uh, policymaking partnership, and they set up a Seoul Social Economy Center uh, based on this partnership. I think this is very important action and uh, contribute to creating positive political momentum for social and solidarity enterprises. And also it influences hugely to other uh, local governments. Next. Uh, from this partnership, uh, 
uh, the Seoul Social Economy Center was uh, set up, uh, founded. And as you can see here, the center uh, uh, had a uh, uh, key, uh, had played uh, uh, several roles, including identifying uh, and providing support for social and solidarity extra, uh, enterprises and, and fostering online and offline hubs for networking, etc. Next. Right now, I uh, explain about the major initiatives, initiatives in Seoul first uh, education program. Uh, uh, based on the partnership, um, Seoul City Government developed the Social and e uh, Social Economy Academy, and from this program, more than I think seven thousand citizens educated, and forty-five courses are developed about uh, uh, social economy. Next, this is the website of. Uh, uh, Social Economy Academy, and if you visit here, you can watch the online video clip about social economy in general, as well as uh, uh, management skills, including marketing and financing, etc. Next, my university, which is a Sungong University, one of the education institution, and we run actually uh, the. Um, social economy education program uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Seoul City Government. Um, um, uh, uh, yearly, uh, more than 50 uh, students, I would say students, uh, enroll this program and then they are eager to learn how to run their organization. Next. Financing is very important, and so city government set up a Seoul Investment Fund. Uh, as you can see here, uh, for five years, um, they uh, they assigned several uh, uh, budget uh, with uh, a private partnership. And, well, uh, but it is quite controversial. This fund is really uh, if efficient or effective or not. Uh, anyway, uh, move to the next page. Uh, the other uh, major initiative is public uh, procurement for social and solidarity enterprises by uh, Seoul city government. Uh, actually, uh, Seoul city government passed the two uh, uh, ordinance for public uh, procurement. So since then, as you can see here, the size of uh, sales of uh, SSE is increasing, but still uh, the portion is quite limited, it's just 1.3%, I think, of the total I mean, procurement in a uh, city government. But it will be uh, get, get better soon. Next. This is information uh, uh, web page. Uh, if you visit so social economy portal, I think you can get all kind of information, including education information, financing information, even uh, hiring information, etc. So this uh, website is really crucial. And monthly, more than uh, 100 posted, uh, 100 video clips and um, letters are uploaded and uh, monthly, I think more than 10,000 citizens visit this portal to get information about social economy. Next. Last year, uh, Seoul City Government announced a social economy promotion plan 2.0. Uh, mainly it emphasizes uh, the participation of citizens uh, because the citizens' participation is quite important to boost a social economy. Uh, that's probably the reason why uh, this plan emphasizes the participation uh, of uh, uh, normal citizens. Next. Well, as a wrap up, uh, I do believe that next, next slide, please. 
I do believe that uh, legal and uh, various public policy measures are quite important to, uh, uh, fundamentally, but uh, however, the autonomy and independence and management skills of uh, social and solidarity enterprises are also important so that we can boost the social economy together. Next. All right, this is uh, my story uh, about Seoul. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me as uh, uh, the email. Thank you. Thank you, sang -yun. Um Before I move on to Mexico City case study, I have a small announcement to facilitate this interpretation. I mean, uh, when you are speaking, you have to select off button in interpretation symbol. Otherwise, there will be some problems in uh, interpretation functions. So uh, now I'd like to ask Roberto Canedo to present the case on Mexico City. The floor is yours, Roberto. Good afternoon. Now, this is a paper that we've done on policies to promote social and society economy, the case study of Mexico, which we did in conjunction with the UNRIST, United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. The project is on uh, promoting uh, social and solidarity economy through public policies, guidelines for local governments. So this uh, study uh, is a study on the experiences of Mexico City as to the characteristics of the design and implementation of public policies for promoting SSC. Uh, these are policies that were introduced between 2016 and 2019. Now, we should first of all mention that there is a uh, historical background here. The uh, origins of these policies date back to 2000. However, it was not until 2007 that uh, specific programs to promote and strengthen uh, that the Ministry of Labour and Employment Promotion actually began to implement specific programs for uh, cooperatives. It drew on indirect budgets from various departments of the Government of Federal Districts, which is now known as the Government of Mexico City. Then it had its own uh, budget. Then between 2014, uh, the program for the promotion, strengthening, and integration of cooperatives, the PPFIC was established. A total of 157 cooperatives were supported. That comprises 2,442 people. In 2015, the support program for the development of cooperatives in Mexico City was then launched. And then in 2000, we had the program for the promotion, establishment, and strengthening of social and solidarity enterprises. That's known as FOCOFES for short. The methodology that we employed uh, was carried out over three different stages. In the first stage, we carried out an exhaustive review of the relevant resources, books, articles, documents, laws, uh, regulations, journals of legislative debates, and also in particular, the rules of operation of the various different programs. Uh, we also reviewed the calls and evaluations that were published in the official gazette of the federal district in 2016 and in 2017 in the official gazette of Mexico City. Then we moved on to the second stage that involved the gathering of information in the field from key informants, uh, namely officials and former employees of departments, but also managers and members of the beneficiary cooperatives and instructors that were accredited by STIFE, uh, the government department, and we also consulted scholars. At the third stage, the final stage, we gathered information and then we organized and analyzed this information uh, to finally draft the final report. Now, during this period of study, we uh, made the following findings. First of all, the public policy to promote SSC in the city of Mexico was maintained to a large extent by the forces of legal and institutional inertia and also as a result of the pressure of existing social demand. Furthermore, there's a subsidiary complementary and dependent element of the general social policy of the government of Mexico City. Uh, this includes, for example, programs to combat unemployment. Number three, between 2015 and 2018, very modest results were achieved, and these m results were tempered by model management by officials and beneficiaries of the SSC support resources and programs. 
Fourth point, from 2019 forwards, uh, with the FOCO-FES program, public policy onwards a significant shift. It introduced highly centralized administrative procedures that were aimed at eradicating corruption. However, the implementation of these procedures resulted in all kinds of excesses. An example could be the mass dismissal of personnel, the failure to rehire trained instructors, and also to renew the positive aspects of the previous programs. Number five, uh, as part of the Republican austerity policy in force in Mexico at the time, only 16 staff members were rehired. This was insufficient for the scale of the targets that were to be achieved. As a result of this, the institutional structure was overwhelmed by the magnitude of the demand. So if we look at the SPI, which is the um, promotion so program, they quickly achieved its target, but the way that the cooperatives were set up was defective. This suggests that very few of these uh, cooperatives are going to survive even in the short term. And in the case of the SPF, the other program, uh, the strengthening program, these targets were not reached. So if we look at the FOCOFES program, it lacked precision or strategic clarity. And those that were responsible for implementing it were not able to measure, to guide or channel the transformative and innovative potential of SSE. Instead of implementing a, a vital and organic public policy, instead of using an ongoing and constructive dialogue with beneficiaries, all they have managed to do is implement it in an instrumental sense. They've simply limited themselves to complying with formalities of administrative processes. They've fulfilled quantitative goals, but the problem is that they have not thought about its direction or management in a strategic sense. Next point is that the current legal framework is not being implemented, it's not being enhanced. Uh, so this means it's out of step with advances in the constitutional text of the city. It also means it's at odds with other legal systems. Could you, could you please mute yourself uh, if you haven't yet, because we hear background noises. Whoever has the microphones to load. It's yeah. I, iPhone de Maria is making the background noise is, is coming from iPhone de Maria. Okay. Okay. Um, so the legal framework is out of step with procurement law, with social development law. Um, there's a need to align all legislation applicable to SSE enterprises with the local constitution. There's also a need to undertake a comprehensive reform of the law. And amongst other things, this is going to enable these regulations to bed down, as it were, in the different municipalities. Next point. The way that the programs are implemented is just not adequate. There's no objective diagnosis of the conditions in which the cooperatives pursue their organizational and entrepreneurial activities. There's a lack of studies and research on this subject. And there's no clear directory on the work that's being done by the implementing institution. This shows, uh, this would show us how many and which cooperatives have been supported and what the tangible results have been, but we do not have this. So therefore, um, we require the preparation of an updated directive of existing cooperatives in Mexico City. This is a task that cannot be delayed any longer. We need to aim to create an updated and reliable register of cooperatives that's available to all in physical and digital form and also that's freely accessible to the general public. Moreover, there's excessive inflexibility in the way that the programs work and they're also very short. This means that administrative procedures need to be streamlined. They need to be made more flexible to make them less complex and less bureaucratic. There needs to be a commitment to digitalizing procedures, uh, also digitalizing the delivery of documents. If we speed up the process, then we'll be able to publish responses to applications online. This will contribute to transparency in the allocation of public funds. So our recommendation is this study first of all recommends that we reduce the number of home visits as part of the training exercise. Uh, this will be essential. So we should establish a procedure for the geo-referencing of each of the beneficiary cooperatives. And this will help us to have real-time status updates. 
Next recommendation. We need to overcome institutional short-termism. We need to develop multi-year programs that will help us to achieve more far-reaching goals. In a period of between five and 10 years, we could achieve a hard consolidated core of several dozens of cooperatives. Uh, if we had this, they would then act as a guiding force to support the social action of the rest of the cooperatives. These could be cooperatives that have been recently created or that are in the process of consolidation. And thus we would achieve the sustainability of the local cooperative movement. Next recommendation, we need to place limits on intergroup conflicts. These are conflicts in the management of institutional spaces. There's a constant turnover of senior officials and there's an inability to form cohesive working teams between middle management and operational management. We need to overcome this to ensure continuity and so that we can fully complete all of these programs. Next recommendation, we have to put an end to the lack of coordination between the various public bodies, particularly at the level of the city of Mexico, the government, and of the government of the 16 municipalities of Mexico City. Next point, we need to ensure that SSC promotion programs avoid cronyism. We've seen a clientelistic apportionment of quotas amongst all the power groups. So it would be advisable in the coming years to place a greater emphasis on qualitative aspects, i.e. training and technical support, over the quantitative aspects, i.e. number of cooperatives formed or strengthened. The targets of the FACOFES program should therefore be rethought, uh, rethought in uh, comparison to the targets that were set for 2019. Final recommendation, we need to have permanent assessment of these programs by institutions that are turn external to the government of Mexico City. This will uh, allow for feedback, improvements in key aspects such as training, technical assistance, financial support, access to markets, dialogue with the cooperative movement, and finally with dissemination of the programs and their achievements. Thank you very much. Now we will go for the final presentation of Durban case, which is going to be the last one for this first subsession. Uh, Creating an enabling and solidarity economy, SSE, through public policies in Durban, South Africa. The city of Durban is known in municipal context as the Itiquini Metropolitan Municipality. I refer to it as ETMM referring to the larger area of the metropole. Itequini is derived from the word Iteko, meaning bay or lagoon in Zulu, and is a popular destination for a seaside holiday. Durban is the third most popular city in South Africa and the largest city in the province of KwaZulu Natal. These uh, maps contextualized Durban within the Itiquini metropole in South Africa by firstly showing in the upper left corner the nine provinces of South Africa. Then next to it, in the upper right, the provinces are divided in municipal districts, followed by a map of the district of KwaZulu-Natal, bottom left, and then the map of the Itiquini metropolitan municipality showing the location of Durban, bottom right slide. The SSE in context of the three levels of government. The first level of government is the national government, elected and responsible for approving laws and policies by parliament. The provincial legislator, develop and approve strategies for these laws and policies. While local government, it is the ETMM or Durban, the implementation guidelines for the strategies of the provincial legislator are developed and executed on municipal levels. Synergistic relationships on all levels of government together with stakeholders are required for a, and a prerequisite for successful implementation. It's very important to understand that it is required by law that the government of South Africa consult very broadly before a law is brought to Parliament or even an implementation of the law is being done. 
The size of the SSE in South Africa. Active entities are operational while inactive entities are either dormant, did not submit the annual reports, or is a shelf company. That means it's bought by, for instance, an attorney to be kept in an office until a client wants to purchase the company. 30% of non-SSE companies are active, while 80% of SSEOs are active. Accordingly, the focus is on active SSEOs and active non-SSEOs for purposes of analysis. The SSE sector in terms of functional entities is much larger than estimated. Therefore, the SSE represents 17% of the total of all active registered entities in both sectors, while the remaining 83% represents the non-SSEOs. Policies and institutions. The ETMM's main approach capitalize and synergize existing policies, frameworks and acts. The Cooperative Development Plan, or CDP, is an example. The ETTM assisted their work streams, such as grass cutting, cleaning, and other services, to transform into cooperatives with awarded contracts through the prefer preferential procurement policies. The Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry, BCCI, leverage existing legislation on enterprise development to assist the SSE in becoming sustainable and they provide training. Universities are expected to serve the communities in which they operate and therefore have several programs for community engagement and furthering enterprise development. The private sector engages policies such as corporate social responsibility, broad-based black economic empowerment, triple B, double E, and the enterprise development policy to assist the SSE through grants, training, and preferential procurement. Stakeholders and actors. The ETMM is the exemplar in local government context in creating an enabling environment for the development of SSE organizations. Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry, DCCI, supports the SSE through training, mentoring, and other services. All levels of government are actively participating in the promotion and development of the SSE. Universities, University of KwaZulu Natal and Durban University of Technology, leverage existing legislation to train the SSEOs in the management of enterprises. Several institutions, such as APEX bodies, associations, financial and cooperative banks, are actively involved in promoting and developing the SSEOs. International Labour Organization sponsored the facilitation for a draft green paper on the social economy. Marketing SS Goods and Services, ETMM, facilitate access to markets where possible, local, national, international. Link SSE to retail outlets. The annual Durban Fair exhibit their goods, create a platform for networking for business with the private sector. Government agencies, example is CEDA, training with inter alia marketing and providing linkages to commerce and industry as well. DCCI links the SSEO to clusters within the chambers geared to assist the SSE to make more significant impact in their communities. Organizations or associations or other stakeholders that promote the SSE and link them to opportunities. Finance and access to finance. Preferential procurement through the public and private sector is deemed to be part of enterprise development. The private sector receives tax breaks for corporate social responsibility, CSR, and enterprise development. The Itaquini Metropolitan Municipality does not provide direct funding, but in the case of charities or social enterprises, the ETMM provides an annual grant. Small Enterprise Development Agency, CEDA, has a cooperative incentive scheme with a 100% grant of 350,000 South African rands 
to registered primary cooperatives. The Small Enterprise Finance Agency, or CIFA, the Independent Development Corporation, IDC, and cooperative banks provide loans to SSEOs with certain conditions. Training and capacity building. Stakeholders believe training and capacity building are key to SSEOs' sustainability and scalability. Example, the EPMM training program, also known as non-financial support, covers several management areas such as governance, financial literacy, marketing, and solving conflicts. Incubators are sponsored by CEDAW for the EPMM, as well as the two universities. Some social enterprises, the DCCI, sector apex bodies, and government departments provide training and capacity building for the SSEOs. Scaling up a monitoring and evaluation. Scaling up requires access to finance, planning, funding, and the right system, staff, processes, technology, and partners. Connecting with other enterprises and networking enables this process of scaling up the enterprise, apart from hard work and access to finance. Monitoring and evaluation, or M&E, the formalized framework with which the EPMM will monitor and evaluate the cooperatives to ensure that planned milestones are achieved has been approved. M&E would serve as an early warning system to alert the underachievement. The continuous sharpening and focusing will assist EPMM in the mobilization of appropriate interventions. Projects and grants are monitored and evaluated by the private sector funders themselves. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for all uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, we are behind the schedule by around 17 minutes. So I would suggest to reduce um, Q&A by five minutes and uh, break five minutes as well. So we will have 15 minutes uh, Q&A time instead of 20 minutes. And uh, for your information, I will ask presenters to share their presentation files with us. So we will put them or upload them to a website of GSEP or UNMIS. So if you want to have a look at the presentation files, please visit uh, either a GSEP website or UNMIS website. So I will open the floor for Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Uh, I told you how to raise your hand in Zoom. So if you go to participants and you can find raise hand button, and if you click that symbol, I will notice you raise the hand. Okay, I will open the floor. So we have a question from Alan Serden, uh, Liverpool University. What do the authors believe is driving growth in SSE? So what would be the drivers of growth in SSE? I think obviously we are talking about public policies. So maybe uh, authors can talk about key policies to drive the growth in SSE in different contexts, like a Durban, Mexico City, and so on. Maybe um, we can start with uh, Durban. Susan? Um, I think that the biggest drivers in the case of Durban is actually on local government le level, where, where the implementation actually comes into operation. So once you've, you have the local government buying into and the provincial government providing the strategy, the implementation is really the driver. And in the case of Durban, the Durban municipality are unbundled all the uh, work streams for grass cutting, for cleaning and so on. And they actually allowed them to become cooperatives. And these cooperatives act independently, but through the preferential procurement, which is a very important policy, they actually uh, get the contracts from the municipality to carry on the work. But this is a vibrant cooperatives that are in Durban, and that policy interpretation, and with other laws, 
Because we have the cooperative law of 2005, but we have other laws like preferential procurement. We've got enterprise development uh, where the uh, private sector is rewarded by tax breaks to actually train, to provide opportunities and preferential procurement to uh, the SSE, as well as CSR providing um, the, the SSE with loans, not only with loans, but also with grants or projects that they have to carry out on behalf of the, uh, 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 the private sector. So this is a uh, the enabling policies play a very important role, as well as the interpretations, on the other hand, uh, to, uh, uh, to boost the social and solidarity economy in Durban. Thank you very much. Um, maybe Mexico City case uh, from Roberto. Bueno. Thank you. I think there's one thing we need to understand in terms of growth in SSC. Well, it has been incredibly fast. If you have a crisis, I think uh, that leads to the social and solidarity economy expanding very rapidly. And over the last three decades, we have gone from seeking to implement uh, drastic neoliberal policies, and that marginalized the SSC sector, but the we did indeed have the possibilities to expand, and the main actors, the main stakeholders involved did indeed address the issue, and we found that, that they looked at um, inefficiency and corruption cases, and now we're entering a new era where SSC is growing significantly, but we're trying to put everything in the right place now so that we can ensure that the realities of the SSC sector is reflected through the policies. We need the right public policy so as to ensure that we can bring forward the proposals for coordinating public policy, reorganizing the movement, and, and ensuring interaction between the two. But I think that um, we are indeed in a crisis for SSE, but an expansion crisis, so it's positive in a way. A few other questions as well. Um, Thank you very much. I think the there are several questions about the uh, independence or autonomy of social economy. For instance, if there is a kind of dominant control of the state uh, in economic uh, sectors. I mean, the, what would be the role of SSE? I mean, how SSE can maintain their goals and objectives, and if there is a kind of dominant market force, so people will invest uh, their money for economic uh, gains only, what would be the role of SSE? I think that those questions can be applied to all those um, SSE actors and policymakers, and uh, maybe uh, I can direct these questions to Sang Yun. I mean, they, you know, if there is a kind of strong state control uh, over economic issues, and uh, you know, how, what what should be the role of SSE to maintain their objectives and uh, to be functional in managing uh, social and economic activities and objectives? Well, thank you for asking. Uh... Well, fundamentally, I think uh, legal and you know institutional frameworks are quite important to boost the social ecosystem because the official status of this uh, institution itself, I think, enhances the visibility of uh, SSEs on policy agenda, especially in you know, lawmakers you should know, I mean, about what are important things uh, in uh, our economy. Uh, and also the legal frameworks contribute to creating favor in policy and political environment. So uh, fundamentally, I do believe that, I mean, it's too much maybe Korean context, but I think uh, legal and uh, institutional frameworks are important. At the same time, uh, improving management skills and the understanding social concept by SSEs are uh, also important. I mean, 
uh, in some cases in South Korea to just get fund, they like uh, uh, looks like uh, social and solidarity enterprises, but actually, finally, they just want to pursue the money or the fund and finally gone. So um, I think uh, to remedy this problem, uh, education, uh, programs are quite important and nationally or locally. Um, I think local governments especially boost uh, to enhance the education program for the social economy. What is social economy? What's their role? Uh, something like that. Uh, and in addition, I think they should provide uh, the management consulting kind of services to improve their management skills. Uh, of uh, SSAs uh, so that they can be independent from the like, government fund. And also, uh, they should know how they should learn uh, their organization democratically. So democratic control is quite important um, uh, to SSAs. So education and a training program for uh, social enterprises, quite important, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, the, there are some questions about the key challenges to public policies to promote SSE and the uh, influence of political context on SSE too. I think those questions are the key questions to policymakers, especially those politicians uh, in the context of local areas. And now we have a comment uh, from Ronald, the, the mayor of Nakawa in, in Kampala, Uganda. I think the, he is a politician and policymaker of social uh, the poli policies for SSE uh, in the context of local government. So I think maybe we can get some answers to these questions. Okay, Ronald, floor is yours. Good uh, morning to everybody. My name is uh, Balimwezo Ronald Yosuga. I'm the mayor of Nakawa Division, Kampala. Mine is uh, a small one. We have a very big challenge that most of uh, the SSEs are informal. And uh, that government has put uh, very, very many bureaucratic um, and unrealistic requirements for them to register. Formalizing uh, SSEs in Uganda is still learning to meet. And yet, uh, majority of our people are very, very, very poor. I wonder what we could do in order to basically be able to register some of these uh, SSEs. OK, thank you very much. I think the, those questions should be dealt with um, in the second part of this discussion uh, when we talk about four case studies, because all those questions are relevant to uh, local governments. And maybe we can get some answers from the uh, case studies presentations by the following uh, presenters uh, on Montreal, um, Barcelona, and other, other cities, Liverpool. So uh, we, can, we can listen to those um, presentations to think about the answers to those questions. And I suggest to have a break, but very short break, five minutes break. So we're gonna resume uh, at uh, within five minutes. So it's gonna be five to 19 in Geneva time, uh, depending on where you are. You can calculate the time, but you can have uh, practically five minutes break. So we will resume again. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for the first part of this uh, discussion. And I will see you again very soon. Thank you. And if it was a physical meeting, uh, it could have been a time to take a group photo, but uh, we kind of improvised kind of an innovative approach to group photo. So, Please turn on your camera and try to show your best side to the camera. And we're going to have a screenshot instead of group photo. So please turn on your camera and show your best side. And our, our uh, cameraman, 
somewhere bloody sour would take a, a screenshot uh, all of you so uh, Juan Jose Rojas I mean the I, I don't see you Arun and Lawrence uh, they all maybe okay so are you ready are you ready so um do toi yeah you got it Samuel yeah. Okay, yes, great. I, I got a couple. Okay. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much. So <laughs> we will we will resume the session. And this session is going to be the presentation of four case studies. And we will go for Barcelona. I see Aram has raised her hand. Is there some, something? Yeah, Aram. No, nothing. I just clapped. <laughs> Oh, okay. oh, nice. <laughs> okay. okay, we will go for Barcelona case by Rafael Chavez Avila. Rafael, the floor is yours. Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, in Valencia, we, uh, we are... Uh, son las, buenas tardes, son las 7 de la tarde. A ver. So, good afternoon. It's 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. First and foremost, I'd like to... Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be at what is a global social economic forum. And I'm delighted to be able to share with you the findings of this study that we have been conducting over recent months. Of course, we cooperated with UNRIST and uh, GSEF on this particular study. I'd like to also give thanks to Mr. Il Jung uh, for leading this project in this study, but not only this project, but other projects that he is driving that I think are extremely relevant, particularly in this case, advocating for greater scientific, academic and intellectual work so that we can help to develop the social and solidarity economy uh, internationally. So congratulations and thanks to you and to everybody in the team, Samuel. Uh, and uh, many others. So, here from uh, Valencia and from our organization, we've been working for many years on the social economy. It's certainly not new for us. In fact, two and a half years ago, we published a study for a uh, European Committee on Good Practices and Policies for the Development of Social Economy and Enterprises in Europe uh, and the prospects thereof. So I think uh, certainly it was very useful for us to be able to participate on that particular study. I'd also like to point out that since the financial crisis of two, between 2008 and 2013, we have moved towards a new context in terms of developing the social and solidarity economy. We do talk a great deal of the fact that we now have a new generation of policies to promote SSE. So in Barcelona, it's certainly not few, new for us. We have a long background in Barcelona, but also in many other countries too. Not in all countries, but in many countries, both nationally, regionally, and at city level in Spain. This is also the case. For example, if you take a look at our constitution, this is from 1978, and it talks about the development of social enterprises. And then from 1980, we had the very first policies to help develop uh, the social economy. But in specific terms, it was in 2015 when we saw a change that led us to this new generation of policies to promote SSC regionally, but also locally. We must bear in mind the fact that Spain did suffer greatly from the last financial crisis, and it was one of the countries that had to apply very harsh austerity policies in the years following on from 2011, between 2011 and 2014. We had at that time a very conservative government nationally, but also in many regions. But then in 2015, there was a trigger, a catalyst. And this was a change in politics, 
regionally, nationally, but also at municipal level. And many new progressive governments were voted in. This was the case in Barcelona, Madrid, Valencia, many other cities too in Spain. New political parties were formed as well. And these new political parties incorporated in their political manifestos issues related to the social and solidarity economy. This was the case, and is the case, as we will see, of the city of Barcelona. So we had these municipalities like Barcelona, and it was precisely these councils, town councils, that led in the introduction of these new policies. And I think this new generation is very different to the first generation from the past. In fact, in our case study, we did look at this in closer detail. So if we look at the case of Barcelona, which is what we study in our particular case study for this project. And I think that the case of Barcelona is very relevant for various different reasons. Firstly, because there was a very successful introduction of these policies. They looked at the errors made by Madrid or Valencia, for example, and these same mistakes were not made in Barcelona. So if we look at Barcelona, the municipal government was very decisive and determined in its approach. And the way that it introduced these new policies took a very close look at the idea of policies that transform in the social and solidarity economy. So what this new generation of policies does actually brings a proper focus on this new way of making policy. So let's take a look at our methodology in the development of this case study. Well, first and foremost, we like working in partnership when we conduct our studies. So we looked for professional colleagues political representatives from the city of Barcelona. In fact, I went to my friend, <laughs> Georgi Vier, who is uh, an intellectual leader uh, who has driven this new kind of policy in Barcelona. He was the commissioner for the social and solidarity economy for the Barcelona Town Council. And he's a very important promoter for this. And we also worked with another colleague, Jordi, as well, who is an activist. And he has continued to develop the various different strands of the social and solidarity economy. So it's been very easy to work with the, these two colleagues. Uh, it wasn't just the university that conducts the research, but we brought in these very important local political stakeholders. And I think it's very important for us to get first-hand knowledge by talking to people, but also we had to do a literature review. But I think it's very important also that we also involve the policy makers of the city. So we created two focus groups. First focus group with policy makers, which we included the current commissioner for social and solidarity comedy for the Council of Barcelona, but also the leaders of the SSE movement in the city of Barcelona. So I think this has led to a very fruitful conversation. No, sadly, um, because of the scope of the report, we haven't been able to include all of their uh, remarks, but it was very fruitful for all. So this report that we have now finished is available in English and in Spanish. Uh, and these are available through the website of this project. Uh, we obviously wanted to publish in English, but we wanted to publish in Spanish too. So let's take a quick look now at the content of the PIESS, which is the uh, policy to stimulate uh, SSE in Barcelona. Well, it came about after the recent municipal elections. The new mayor that was voted in, Ada Kalauf, in a new political party, a progressive political party. Uh, this was the new context in 2015. Therefore, our new mayor showed this will to change things and she appointed Jordi Vier as the commissioner for social and solidarity economy to bring in new policies, new policies that did not exist in Barcelona before this. So this is very important. 
not just the fact that this was a person from the, their political party, but it was a person who had been an activist in SSC in Barcelona. Therefore, he had participated in much of policy making in the past. He knew a lot of people and knew how things worked. But another important aspect was that the local government actually invested in SSC. In fact, they Rafael, could, could dedicated. You lap up, could you wrap up your presentation in two minutes, please? <laughs> Only two minutes. Okay. So the relevant idea is that the budgetary allocation was increased by 800% only over the course of three years. And it's also very important to bear in mind that, and this is something that was not seen in different plans, was the fact that the process of debate and discussing new policies was carried out in a very short period of time. So it was not a protracted process, bringing in all the different sectors and stakeholders, but the approach is more pragmatic. A short period of time was assigned so that they could develop these policies. Uh, it was set down in a short-term plan, a four-year plan with specific objectives, specific areas of action, 50 different areas of action, various different bodies assigned to their tasks, and the end implementation of the plan. So this is all designed meticulously, which helps with the implementation of the plan. And I only have one minute left. Uh, and I would perhaps like to conclude by saying that the important fact is that we're going to comply with four of the key factors that we want to comply with. First of all, that it is cross-cutting across the social and solidarity economy. So this means that we're not only talking about cooperatives or organizations. No, we have to have a wider vision that includes the entire social and solidarity economy. Secondly, that it needed to be participatory. We need to have a co-construction policy of policies. We need to bring in political stakeholders and uh, members of social sector as well. And then third is that the plan needs to be transportive. We don't want to have a palliative approach, but we want to actually catalyze the creation of new policies new processes, new instruments that can bring about change in the city, satisfying everybody's demands. And finally, and I will conclude on this point, fourth point is that we don't want to have a sectoral approach. We don't want this a policy set aside in a ghetto or a silo-based system, but that it will be able to be intertwined with other policy areas and sectors. So we want to mainstream SSC. Obviously, there have been certain barriers to the introduction of this new policy, but we have finally implemented it in the beginning of this year, and we have been successful so far. I apologize for, for running over my thank, time. Thank you very much, Rafael. I think we, we got some hints about the answers to those questions raised in the first half. Uh, okay, let's go for um, Montreal case uh, presented by Professor Margie Mendel. Margie, uh, we have a pre-recorded presentation, right? So That's correct. here's Margie's presentation. Good afternoon, good evening. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Margie Mendel, and I will be joined by my, my colleague and co-author Nancy Ninten um, to discuss with you public policies enabling the social and solidarity economy in the city of Montreal, part of a UNRIS project promoting the social and solidarity economy through public policies, guidelines for local governments. Next, please. Our paper covers um, a period beginning from 2013 to 2019. 2013 marks the uh, year that the Quebec social economy law framework legislation was adopted. But in fact, the social and solidarity economy and all public policies that have enabled it 
are rooted in a process that was initiated by civil society in the mid 1980s. It's important to provide a context for our paper because municipal government in Canada is embedded in a Canadian political system and in division of powers, which severely limits uh, the autonomy of municipalities to enact their uh, autonomous uh, po uh, policies. Canadian cities are creatures of provincial governments with limited revenues and increasing responsibilities. So in that context, provincial and federal policy interventions have been key to the development of the social and solidarity economy in Montreal, and they have been at the source of most strategic public policy measures. Like many other cities, I would say most other cities around the world, devolution of responsibility to city governments is on the rise, along with policy measures to increase their autonomy. Next. Montreal is further divided into numerous boroughs or districts, each of which have their own action plans and priorities, some giving more priority to the social and solidarity economy than others. Overarching policy measures are set by the city administration. Nancy will outline some of these uh, after me. Recent measures by the provincial government are increasing the autonomy of the city of Montreal, and we should say these are very, very recent. So to sum up, there are three predominant trends. In fact, I see I put four. There are four predominant trends. There's a constitutional division of powers, which limits the uh, autonomy of municipal governments, collaboration between uh, three levels of government, mostly two, the province and municipalities. Uh, three, there is a loosening of rigid divisions by introducing new legislation, giving more power to the city, and four, there is also action at the level of boroughs. But we must underscore that within this complex context, the social and solidarity economy is in Montreal rooted in social dialogue, co-construction, and collaborative processes that have been key to the building of its social economy. Policy initiatives have responded to social and solidarity economy collective action on the ground. Next, please. What distinguishes our social and solidarity economy in Quebec and in Montreal is the application of an integrated ecosystemic uh, approach. The entire social economy is embedded in a comprehensive and place-based approach to local development, which is beyond the aggregate of its numerous collective enterprises. The social and solidarity economy has created numerous enabling tools some of which we have outlined here, finance, technical support and accompaniment, training, research, knowledge transfer, citizen mobilization, commercialization. So policy development has been consistently initiated by stakeholders based on the needs and aspirations that have been identified within communities, leading to processes of co-construction within and with all levels of government. So to summarize, <clears throat> the Collaboration occurs horizontally across divisions within levels of government, be it uh, provincial or federal. It also um, occurs vertically between different levels of government, municipal and uh, provincial and federal, quite limited at the federal level. And uh, just to reinforce and repeat, like other cities around the world, devolution of many responsibilities at the municipal level is on the rise, but too often, this is not accompanied by uh, the resources in order to fulfill those commitments. Nancy? Yes, thank you, Margie. So uh, I'll present very briefly some of the major policy initiatives that have impacted on the development of the social economy in Montreal. Um, obviously, there's a lot of documentation that people can look into if they want more detail. Uh, so it's a very brief overview. Um, because, as I said, you know, a lot of the policies are come from the provincial government but have a, a very strong impact within the city. Uh, as was mentioned, the Social Economy Act was a provincial initiative, but what it did was uh, really put the social economy up there as an important axe for development um, and has been integrated over many years in, in economic development policies uh, within the Montreal uh, City Administration. Uh, in the in the period that we that we studied, uh, and um, there's also some interesting developments in terms of new juridical structures, particularly around social utility trusts that are now being experimented in Montreal. 
There was a provincial action plan to support entrepreneurship, which included collective entrepreneurship for the social economy. There has been developments in access to capital through investment tools. There has been um, access to resources for research and particularly for knowledge transfer, which has been very strategic um, as transferring of social innovations in the social and solidarity economy has helped accelerate a lot of new uh, strategies. And then this has been an ongoing for the past uh, over 20 years. We've had policy measures at a provincial level um, in housing and home care, child, uh, child care, recycling, food security, workplace integration. So there's many levels in which provincial um, and federal policies have had impact on the social economy within Montreal. Next. Uh, municipally, there have nevertheless been a certain number of policy initiatives over the years, uh, though it precedes the, 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 the period that we uh, studied, th there was in 2009 a very innovative approach where uh, rather than developing a municipal policy on the social economy, a choice was made to sign a partnership between social economy actors and the city recognizing that the social economy help the city to achieve its goals and, and carry out its mandate. And in return, the, the city administration could be supporting more and in, in, in more strategic ways, the development of the social economy. So that was a partnership agreement that led to the creation of a social economy a, um, office. And ongoing sectoral policy initiatives that have existed over the years in housing and culture and sports and recreation, food systems and so on. These are all things that are ongoing and continue during the period that we studied. There was a new plan, an action plan. This time we talked about social innovation and social economy was integrated into that. But there's been an ongoing procurement initiative uh, uh, that has been trying to close the gap between social economy enterprises and buyers, investment in infrastructure and support for emerging new sectors, new technology, micro transport. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, initiatives that are emerging out of that. Next. So finally, what are the lessons that we can learn from the Montreal experience? Uh, very briefly, uh, we have seen that, um, as, as, as Marjorie Mendel uh, underlined, the importance of an integrated ecosystem systemic approach to supporting the social economy that creates the conditions basically for uh, communities to, to develop these collective initiatives and have the financial tools of technical resources and so on uh, to, to develop them. These are relationships that have been based on partnerships and co-construction right from the beginning. Uh, there, there's been an importance of integrating the social economy, and this is more recent, into an overall vision of ecolo ecological and social transition in an urban setting. So that has been a very clear, a lot of the new thrusts for the social economy in Montreal are very much oriented towards these goals of transition. Um, the strength and resilience of Montreal's social economy, again, is linked to its roots in citizen mobilization and alliances with social movement. For those who know a little bit about the social economy in Quebec, that has been really its key, um, its key factor of strength, that all this has come from the bottom up based on citizen mobilization and dialogue. And finally, perhaps one of the, the most encouraging strengths of the social economy in Montreal had, is a result of a lot of work that was done to, to talk to youth, to work with universities, students, and so on. And as we see that young people are very much attracted to the social economy because of its, its contribution to ecological and social transition and the transformation of the dominant economic model. And in this context, one of the lessons learned is the importance of involving in a, in a very direct way and reaching out to young people because they bring a huge force to the movement. So I guess we will end on that and open up to questions in the period. Thank you very much and good evening, good afternoon and good morning to all. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy and Margie. And Nancy Nimtan and Margie Mender are the co-authors of the Montreal case paper. Now we are going for uh, African City case, Dakar, Senegal, by Malik Diop and Aminata Diop Sam. And we have pre-recorded presentation, right? Bonjour. Je suis, oui, effectivement. Good afternoon. I'm Malik Top, the uh, national coordinator of the Senegalese Network of Stakeholders and Local Authorities for SSC. So I'm going to talk about the experience of the town of Dakar in the design, implementation, evaluation of public policy 
for uh, organizations and cooperatives of the social and solidarity economy in Dakar, a project that we're carrying out with UNREST. First, the context of the study, nation on national level, the context is somewhat favorable to the development of the SSE ecosystem. SSE is, is a volunteer politics. A, a never stronger political will. And this has been seen in the creation of an SSC ministry in 2017. There is also now a legal framework that is being developed through a process of drawing up a sectoral policy brief and also a framework law for SSC which will help us better organize governance within the sector. The next point is that there is a dense network of socioeconomic initiatives which needs to be supported at a local level. And finally, there is now an international and national movement in favor of the promotion of this sector. So let's now look at the process of support for SSC. Now, since 1990, the town of Dakar has initiated more than 10 major isolated or standalone projects, but there's no coherence or defined political strategy. And we needed a development plan that was designed, implemented and assessed through the different phases of design. And this would have involved all of the relevant stakeholders and interactions with the government the central government and this was lacking however all of these different projects that have been developed that we have experienced i think can lay the foundations for uh, an sse policy in our city And this process has created certain constraints or limits in giving support to the social and solidarity economy. The first limit is a lack of coordination, of promotion, and a lack of visibility. There's no coherent and planned policy for SSE. I think the second limit is that there's a weakness in legislative uh, provisions and regulatory provisions for SSC. Next uh, failing is that there's a deficit in human resources for the support process for SSC. And fourthly is that there is a failing, a lack of uh, financing and support uh, mechanisms for projects of the social and solidarity economy. Now, we need to look at decision-making. Now, we need to look at this on two levels. Nationally, first, the uh, Ministry for the Social and Solidarity Economy is now uh, putting in place two decision-making tools. The first is sectoral aid. So this would include uh, a policy to promote microfinance, and this would generally cover the larger areas of the SSC. The second tool is a framework law. This would give structure to and organize the sector. These are two very important tools to aid with the decision-making process. At the level of the town, uh, there are three levels that this can be broken down into. First level is political and legal, with the organization of budgetary allocations through a provision of the code of the local authorities. This would give structure to the planning of the process and it would make the process as participatory as possible. Second level is strategy. The town already has a sustainable development planning department. This uh, 
body is now assisting in the bottom up planning processes for the organizations of the social and solidarity economy within our town. And finally, is the operational scale. Now in Dakar, there are several different structures, including the Department for Health Care and Social Aid. We have the Municipal Development Fund. We have SEBEN. We have the Credit Mutuel. Uh, we have the Habitat Cooperative and so on and so forth. There are many different bodies in our town. And these are many different structures. And the fact is that this multiplicity of structures that is now taking up the reins of the social solidarity uh, economy is not actually going to help a local planned system and process. So. I believe that the town would gain if we clarified and restructured the process better through one single roof. If we had one decision making department that could uh, be in charge of ES SSE policies. Now we need to look at the participatory mechanisms. First of all, we have the advisory council of the town of Dakar. This is a particip participatory management tool that was established on the 8th of September 2009. It has brought together all the various different stakeholders and it issues opinions after a consultation process. Second mechanism is the steering and selection committee for SE projects. It's an open process that allows all the various different stakeholders to see what's happening, to have a transparent overview of these systems, and this works with uh, FODEM, the um, municipal uh, fund, the uh, Credit Mutuel, and all the various different organizations. It's an open process that brings everybody together. And finally, we have the public information workshops. This is a space for exchange, for bottom-up planning. Now we should take a look at the legal framework. Now, there are many different legal forms that cut across the field of social and solidarity economy in Dakar. First of all, we need to break them down into different families of stakeholders. First, we have collective enterprises. So we're talking about cooperatives, mutual companies, foundations, and uh, economic interest groups. These are related more to the primary sector, so agriculture, crafts, fishing. And I think also this affects youth. I think it's very important that we provide these particular people with a lever so that they can have their voices heard. The second mm, family of stakeholders is social enterprises. We're talking about associations, uh, local grassroots community organizations, social purpose incubators, environmental incubators, and social enterprises. So it's a very wide range of different uh, organizations, social enterprises that can work together and do form a very large part of our economic system. And then the third family of stakeholders are the support structures. So we're talking about NGOs, federations, uh, incubators for social enterprises, public and private initiative, and funds dedicated to SSE. Now, in Dakar, we've also set up structures specifically wherein people can sit down at the table together and think about better structuring SSE in our town. So what about support to organizations? Now, we need to look this at this on two different levels. First of all, nationally. The government has put in place several different financing mechanisms. Uh, there's a whole wide range of different financing and support mechanisms that help women, help different uh, groups of stakeholders. Uh, we also help the rural world, world through the National Association for Rural Workers, but also people involved in crafts and so on and so forth. So this is a support structure nationally. Then if we look at it locally, 
it replicates the national level. But what we have now in town are decentralized structures for support. We have a support fund. Uh, and we also have simplified eligibility rules to strengthen capacities. And we do this through a three prong approach. I think this is very important. The three prong approach is training, funding, and support or mentoring. I think this is how we can better strengthen the SSC uh, in our country. Well, what about access to the market and to funding? Now, first of all, I think that we should lament the fact that there is a lack of uh, encouraging or incentive frameworks to help in the public procurement process. And there are many different financial structures, but in general, they are very little adapted to the realities of SSE organizations. So we have banks, we have microfinance institutions, we have national promotion agencies to help finding young people and women, uh, also uh, employment agencies, but all of these different organizations really are ill-suited to work with the demands of the social and solidarity economy. Next, we need to look at uh, the collection of data and research. Now, first of all, there's no systematic approach to data collection, researching and sharing knowledge on SSC. And these limits come out, first of all, because there's a deficit in fully capitalizing on the experiences so far. Secondly, these limits are due to the weakness of statistical data in our town. So I'd like to conclude by giving you a few recommendations. First of all, we need to integrate SSC in regional policies. We need to do this through the drawing up and implementation of local SSE development strategies. Second recommendation, we need to coordinate projects and structures for support by having a central decision-making center. We need an SSE department that takes the entire sector under its wing. Third point, we need accompaniment. We need to set up municipal SSE hubs to um, work along the entire value chain. Final point, we need to strengthen mechanisms. We need to have solid hiring systems in place so that we can work properly with SSC organizations and social enterprises. We need to do this so that we can benefit the plans and programs across the town. So that is what we're doing in our city, and that is the content of our study. Thank you. Thank you, Malik, for your wonderful presentation about the car case. And now we move on to Liverpool case by Professor Alan Sudden. We have pre-recorded presentation again. We have a presentation, but not a pre-recorded one. So I uh, would like to ask Alan to come in as I start the next slide. Thank you. Yes, you can hear me? Yep. Yes. Good. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, and good evening from Liverpool. My name is Alan Southern. Uh, my co-authors uh, on this report were Helen Heap and Matt Thompson. And I'm going to talk to you uh, for the next 10 minutes about the social and solidarity economy in the Liverpool city region. Next slide, please, Sam. Liverpool city region is the administrative boundary for the greater Liverpool area including its hinterlands and the population stands about 1.6 million. This map provides you with an indication of the districts. As you can see, it's centered around the River Mersey and its, its economy has been shaped by its maritime trade, not least the imperial character of the slave trade uh, in some centuries ago, which still has kind of, uh, 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 kind of impacts today. Such was the influence of the maritime trade that uh, the boundaries that you can see were impacted by uh, the wealthy and powerful merchants. The city region suffered uh, econo uh, uh, economically from the 1970s right towards the end of the 20th century, when um, uh, you know a great deal of restructuring took place, industrial restructuring took place, 
and uh, many branch plants uh, uh, left Liverpool City region. It's currently at the centre of a COVID-19 public health crisis in the UK. And uh, I'll mention how the SSC has responded to this a little later. Nevertheless, uh, hospitality retail uh, has been hit very, very hard in the current crisis. And these were some of the growth areas in the recent economy. Next slide, please, Sam. The national framework, the United Kingdom framework, for the SSC is a complex one and its relationship with uh, the local city region has many difficulties, some similar to what we heard earlier on in uh, Montreal in terms of the different scales of governance. Nevertheless, national legislation has been aimed mainly at the uh, for-profit sector in terms of business development. We have uh, no legal form for uh, the social solidarity economy, no legal form for social enterprise. General business legislation has been around company law, and there's been a real ethos of deregulation, which has produced really a, a focus on market ideals for an emergent social enterprise sector. We have had some legislation which is specific for the SSC. Uh, the introduction of uh, community interest companies was one. Community interest companies are trading social enterprises with an asset lock, <coughs> excuse me, um, and in terms of cooperatives, we've had the introduction of what we call uh, BENCOMs, Benefit uh, Community Cooperatives, which has really widened the purpose of cooperatives from benefit of only membership to uh, the wider community. How this is impacting on things like democratic accountability in the economy is an interesting question. And we've also had changes to uh, forms of charities with the introduction of the charitable incorporated organization and basically what that did was simplify some of the administration for charities and we see that there's a rise in CIOs and community interest companies in the later years. Another significant piece of legislation was the Public Services Social Value Act of 2012 and that introduced to, the pub to public agencies the idea of social impact. And as we've seen earlier, it's sort of to encourage uh, procurement. Um, and as a, a, there's an estimated 250 billion pounds per annum spent on public services in the UK. So it's brought a greater focus to uh, economic, social and environmental value, but it's still very limited. In the Liverpool city region, around about 25% of GVA is attributable to the public sector expenditure. So we can see this potential there. Another piece of national legislation uh, of recent importance is devolved governance. The four nations, Wales, England, Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, uh, have seen uh, the support for the SSE slightly differ as that uh, devolved governance has taken place. City region governance has been embedded in England and we see uh, devolved local authorities uh, combined authorities, I should say, and Liverpool City Region is one of those with a metro mayor. And that's given us opportunities to develop the SSE too. Next slide, please. The history of the SSE in Liverpool City Region is an interesting one. It consists of philanthropy associated with the, uh, the trade of the maritime sector, charitable trusts, cooperativism, mutualism and some syndicalist trade unionism as well. In the latter part of the 20th century, uh, community development and housing cooperatives took a turn, uh, particularly uh, as there was increasing tension between Liverpool City Council and the then Margaret Thatcher government. And uh, not always with the housing cooperative sector, community uh, sectors consistent uh, with either local government or central government. Also towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, the city region qualified for high levels of EU funding through the Objective One programme, and that supported the development social enterprise sector. They were able to work in sectors such as training and education and stimulating other forms of entrepreneurship as well. Post 2010, there was an, uh, there's really been an austerity driven response from the, the SSC with some return to the radical politics that we see towards the end of the 20th century, but with a distinct entrepreneurial flavor. 
Our work from 2006 showed there were 1,400 trading organisations in Liverpool City Region, SSE, uh, organisations that traded for a strong social purpose. There was 45,000 employees associated with these organisations, generating £3 billion of revenue per annum with a £4 billion asset base. The point to make is it was really significant within the wider local economy. And until this work, this hadn't been recognised. But there's persistent poverty and the response from the SSE has been important. Next slide, please. Alan, you have two minutes to wrap up. OK, I'll, uh, we see the concentration of the social and solidarity economy with this map. And the real thing I want to draw from this is the concentration of these organisations where it's uh, where poverty reigns. I'll come back to that in any questions. Next slide, please. What do we do to develop the city region solidarity economy? Well, we need to exploit national policy where we can and the devolution of governance. But we need to make sure policy meets the needs of the SSE, and this hasn't been the case previously. Next slide, please. We need initiatives that are coordinated and connected and joined up. And they've got to be co-owned really by the social solidarity economy plus the public and private sectors. We can increase uh, uh, aggregate demand by using the procure procurement policies from the Social Value Act. But we need to expand on this and we shouldn't see the SSE as simply uh, subservient to the public sector. And we need to uh, engage in those private markets too. We should use our devolved governance to establish a stronger voice for the SSE, and we've done this now with the uh, setting up of uh, the, LSE, the SSE reference panel and uh, embedding the local uh, in the local industrial strategy, the social economy. Next slide, please. We need to organise the SSE better. We need stronger support agencies within the sector, greater levels of democracy and accountability and greater levels of diversity. We see the shoots of this and there's been some history that's always provided. Uh, for example, uh, strong support for Bain communities, but we need to do more. We also need to get better forms of finance into the social and solidarity economy. And we've started to do this. And my colleague is going to report on this later on in the conference. Co-production, knowledge, policy, they will raise awareness of the SSE. And this is essential. Next slide, please. Dealing with the crisis, very, very briefly, uh, the SSC responded really early to the crisis, the COVID crisis in March 2020. It was mobilised to support communities. That poverty and place link was really important in exploiting that. But there's financial difficulties. Uh, community funds were initiated and support for social enterprise provided, again, co-produced with the combined authority and the sector. The current phase of crisis, of crisis is really exposing the uh, weaknesses of our devolution arrangements with much disagreement between the city region and national government. And this is threatening uh, our achievements in recent years. To build back, we'll need more resources, planning and more co-production. I'll finish there and thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation touching upon this COVID 19 crisis situation and its impact on SSE policies as well, because there was a question about the influence of COVID-19 on uh, SSE policies. And there are other questions as well, uh, SSE policies to the democratization, the SSE policies contribution to the democratization of the economic policy and impact of accountability and transparency on the SSE policy. So I will open the floor and uh, if you have any questions and comments, uh, please raise your hand or write down in chat window. And uh, while you are writing your questions and comments, maybe uh, I will ask uh, all the presenters um, about these questions. I mean, you can choose and answer the, quest uh, the questions uh, like an uh, influence of COVID-19 in your local areas on SSE policies and the uh, SSE policies contribution to the democratization of economic policies in local areas. Uh, maybe we can begin with uh, Margie and Nancy. Uh, just a minute. Uh... 
si bien las mujeres son este, masivamente okay. clientes de las microfinanzas, no. Ok. Ok, so you want to go, Margie? Um, you have to unmute your microphone, Margie. Okay. Uh, well, I'll we'll be brief so we can. There's interference. Somebody's uh, mic should be turned off. Okay, that's better. Um, <coughs> what well, a direct a direct impact of the COVID crisis uh, is being felt on one sector in particular, not the only sector, but it, and that is home care. Uh, there's a, we had a huge um, uh, tragedy, travesty in, in seniors residences with, hundred, with thousands of deaths and, and the working conditions are appalling. There are negotiations uh, currently underway with public sector workers, but it was so evident that having people in their own homes with home care would have saved uh, a lot of lives. The social and solidarity economy is very present in home care. It was one of the first sectors, and I, I will sh I'll let Nancy continue on it because she was a, le a leader in, in highlighting the importance of having collective enterprises in, in home care. Um, so that's one example. The other would be on uh, local food production and distribution, which is also uh, increasing very rapidly and the establishment of, of uh, social economy enterprises. But let me just say one more thing, one more word on the, the democratization of the economy or of economic policy, but it really is the democratization of the economy. The way in which the social and solidarity economy has developed in Quebec uh, really uh, throughout its, its evolution has been a process of economic democratization. If you take the basic commodities I'm drawing here on the work of Carl Polanyi, but if you take the very basic commodities of land, labor, <clears throat> and money, um, labor, the formation of worker cooperatives and the formation of nonprofit enterprises in the social economy with quality employment and sustainable employment, uh, issues of gender and race and, and, and so on, uh, being at the core of dignified and decent work, uh, on the question of land, we have many uh, community land trusts that are mostly in rural Quebec, but increasingly social utility trusts are being examined uh, in, in the city. Uh, and on the question of money, uh, Quebec was a leader, uh, has been a leader in social finance, in developing uh, social fi finance tools that are operate on a very different basis than mainstream banking or venture capital. And just to end on that, um, in the recent, I participate quite actively in the social finance uh, sector. And almost immediately after the COVID crisis broke out, um, the, uh, the institutions in social finance banded together to create conditions of flexibility on repayment terms and, and so on. Uh, and, and risk uh, calculations and to work with uh, social economy enterprises to really prevent um, the crisis from being broadly um, felt by, uh, by, these, uh, by, by these businesses. So these are, these are just you know, examples and we can go into the digital economy and how that is also being democratized through the consideration of uh, developing platform cooperatives uh, and, and so on. So these are all processes, if you will, of decommodification, deco you know, uh, where the market is embedded uh, in, in society rather than the driver. So these are all processes of, of, uh, of economic uh, uh, democratization. Nancy, want to add to that? Yeah, yeah well, just quickly, uh, uh, around the COVID crisis, I think that as Margie mentioned, the, 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 the response and, and the role that, and the importance of social economy enterprises in several basic sectors to respond to basic needs in housing, in, 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 in food, in, in home care and so on has been really clear there, but there has been one perverse um, impact to a certain extent on some of the business models because there's a, a rap, for example, in food is to go rapidly back into the charitable, uh, you know, perspective of giving food, whereas we've been, Building these models of shared costs, of you know social terrification, to 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 have a sustainable cost sharing kind of approach, but I think that where the impact of the of the COVID crisis and and the jury is out because we don't know whether we're going to succeed or not, and and it's true and and, and it's been mentioned by others, is that it it you know things that we've been saying for years about the importance of these kinds of you know service uh, you know and sector and these kinds of this kind of employment in, in some kind of a 
cohesion of our society, the fact that the economy doesn't run any, everything, we have to actually shut down the economy for the, you know, for the health and, 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 and to save people's lives. Uh, you know, a lot of things about local buying, local purchasing, uh, you know, all those kinds of things that were part of the discourse or part of the, you know, the vision of, of the social economy have risen. And, and so there's an issue now of whether we can make sure that those kinds of realizations of, you know, uh, are going to be able to become, you know, embedded in future policies in terms of recovery. And that's where the social economy actors are very, very, we're very working very hard on making all kinds of proposals of how to work based on that kind of other economic logic. But again, we will see how that works itself out in the next while. But Thank you very much. Seems to be very long. Well, social economy always grows in crisis periods. I'll start there. So. Thank you very much. Malik, do you have anything to make comments? Malik? Oui, je voudrais juste, je pense, ajouter dans la même veine parce que les, les contextes un peu changent. La... Yes, the context changes and that means that people adapt accordingly and they work more on a local level. And that's what we're seeing in Senegal. Here people, here people uh, had to face lockdown of course, and that meant that people, the normal forms of operations were not possible. People could not go out. And so in order to respond, we needed to, uh, we found that local people, would, uh, local actors no longer had the legal means to act or to change things. And so work had to be done at a central level. Central government had to bring in a decree in order to reorder the way things work at a territorial level so that the actors could operate and so that work could be done with local organizations to address the issues of food, ensuring that those who are the most in need have their needs addressed. So health teams were set up to fight COVID at a local level. And so what we saw is that the government, well, the, the democratic functioning of the government was not previously appropriate and had to be changed. And this meant that we had to bring in administrative reforms to see how we could uh, make bring back democracy, democracy at a local level, so as to provide responsibilities to access to public markets, access to food at a local level, and also looking at how local authorities and local bodies can reorganize themselves so that they can look at ensuring a local market, producing more, uh, ensuring local produce, local short circuit markets. Um, so it was looking at democracy in a different way at a local level. That is really what brought about change, that really brought about changes. So it was local elected officials um, working with central government, trying to raise awareness on the need for a paradigm shift and uh, giving much more democratic power or economic power to local actors so that they can give us, so that they can address uh, crises uh, health cri the health crisis, uh, the food crisis, the social crisis, the economic crisis as well. So I believe that these were fundamental aspects in the COVID crisis, and uh, it, was it was really about democratic governance. Thank you. And, uh, Lampaya Amidi, could you briefly comment on one of these questions, whether it is about COVID-19 or accountability and transparency or democratization of economic policies or economy? Thank you very much. So I would uh, echo a lot of what has been said by our colleagues regarding the crisis. And maybe I can speak briefly from the Spanish perspective. Spain is a country that has been and continues to be severely affected by the crisis. And the COVID-19 crisis had a severe impact above all on care, on the elderly and care homes, as we've heard from other colleagues. And um, SSE, what, we, what has happened is that cooperatives 
have responded, at least in Spain, in Valencia, and in Catalonia, at least, they have responded very well. They've provided responses to the health emergencies that have arisen. So one example is that in Spain, in mid-March, we did not have face masks. So we found ourselves in a situation of extreme emergency. One of the main bodies that tried to provide masks was the Mondragon group that bought uh, machinery to be able to supply, to be able to make face masks and supply them. But um, it was really uh, ag agricultural cooperatives, consumer cooperatives throughout the whole of the crisis. They were all exemplary in this in this period. They really behaved, they um, operated very well. We have studies in Spain that reveal that the impact of the crisis was lower. This has this always happens. Uh, we find that the impact of COVID was lower than in normal conventional companies. So the uh, need for layoffs was much lower than in other companies. And this shows that cooperatives are, are resilient in this type of situation. And we must underscore that the crisis also represents a new opportunity for changing our model. And the same happened with the previous crisis. So when social devastation occurs, when economic devastation occurs, that is a tremendous opportunity, a huge opportunity to change the model and public policy as well. Furthermore, in Europe at this moment in time, this is what we are looking at in 2020. 2020 is the year when the European Commission has brought about changes and they're changing uh, policies uh, in the next few for the next few years. So they're looking at deep-rooted issue, issues such as the ecological transition, digitalization, and resilience. These are three axes where, where the social economy is very well positioned. We are already very well positioned in these areas. And now we in Barbecho, they're developing a European plan for the social economy at a European level. And we hope that this will include all of these dimensions I've mentioned. So this is a time of great opportunity to deploy this type of new policy to encourage a social economy. In Spain, this has already been done in July the Spanish government approved the recovery plan. And in this plan, the role set aside for the social economy is significant. And uh, the Valencian local authorities have done that as well. In Barcelona, also, we saw that social movements responded immediately to the crisis. Above all, those who are uh, behind the social and solidarity economy. And they demanded an economy for our lives. So. Uh, an economy focused on our lives. So looking at a way of changing policy at a regional level in Catalonia in the right direction. So it's not just how they have responded, but they have also offered significant proposals in terms of what the social economy can offer. And I believe that this is very important to stress today. Thank you. I think we've been through seven different contexts of different cities, uh, but UCLG has more than 200 city cases and local government cases, I guess. And I'd like to hear some views from Sarah, you know, uh, overseeing all those different cases of their members uh, in responding to this COVID-19 crisis and uh, the relationship between SSC and democratization of economy or economic policies and influence or impact of accountability and transparency issues on SSC. I mean, do you have anything to add to what has been said by our presenters. Sara? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Voy a hablar en español, que estamos en México. So uh, I'm in Mexico now, so I'll speak Spanish. So I think that uh, what we have heard what we've heard from the other researchers is very inspiring and just now we heard it from Malik and we find that they're finding new paths ahead which were completely unexpected before so a need for local government a need for neighborhood a need for working with your neighbors having a neighborhood a neighborly vision and then in a crisis either everybody gets everybody knuckles down uh, with social values or will be ruined. So I think this is 
uh, on, at a global level, we're seeing the need for local government, local authorities, and this has been underscored in several of the presentations already. And this really confirms what we heard from Barcelona and Valencia, that really stresses uh, the need for local government and those affected by the crisis have been helped immensely uh, above all in terms of their mental health because uh, support has been provided in their immediate surrounding areas and this has meant that many people are now looking for a more local economy a more circular economy an economy more nearby near to their homes but above all a more a much greater solidarity in the economy so when li when thinking about the covid issue i just wanted to share the inspiration that we heard that e despite the emergency that we're in progress can be made and 60 percent of local governments in our area are connected to us whether it be in large cities or smaller or medium-sized areas and all of these have spoken about a need to act immediately, a need to act very quickly. So on the one hand, they have been able to solve, they've been able to solve the problems of their citizens and they've been able to provide solidarity and public services. I think public services, that's a, something that we have heard in almost all of the presentations. So really it's about strengthening the discourse around public policy, but above all, uh, providing public services because never before had there been such a need. There was never such a difference between uh, public health care and private health care. Now we really do see the difference between the two and the need for changing the focus. So this is these are priorities for us to follow and we find that many different priorities have been coming together. The future that we see now the paths ahead for local government, the needs for local government. This is where well, we can see it's really one of the levels of government which can really solve the problems in a holistic, comprehensive way. And this future is more a solidarity future, but it is as a future of more care. It's a future of uh, more a more circular approach. It's also being more alert and listening to science and also paying attention to the climate. So for us and this gathering here today, I'd like to put an open question to you all. How can we connect these uh, social and solidarity economies to those other priorities, the other agendas that people have? And in this way, we can be stronger, we can have greater strength because there's no doubt that all of what we're living in our cities is great progress. And we've heard, um, we've heard that you learn, it's one step after another, you learn the different steps, but really this is great because the social and solidarity economy, as we have heard, we've heard that we've got a lot of participation from the private sector, well, we've also got NGOs coming on board, we've also got foundations, and this is a great strength. And from the perspective of local governments, this can really uh, be an entrance point for public policy. Um, government is not necessarily a, a financing agent of all of the initiatives that are based on solidarity. Sometimes local governments are just an agent that brings people together rather than providing financing or as well as providing financing. So we need to show the strength of how we can link the different elements together. So as Rafael, we, we've got Mondragon, that, that, that's a very good example in Spain. But how does, how can this, how can we work at the level of local governments to look at how our economy can be in the future? The intention really has to be one of creating a sustainable economy. And we know that a lot of work needs to be done, but really it's uh, local governments. Local governments often have limitations. They have restrictions and uh, it's not 
just that you can simply say, let's have more inclusion, more solidarity, more support, more rights. You, you can't necessarily say that immediately. The strongest anchor point is in partnerships, in bringing together the different elements, joining them up. And okay. I think this is something that we could stress to a greater deg degree, and in this way we can be stronger. Um, and one final point which I'd like to raise is that here I heard Malik speaking about youth, young people, but there was not a dif not much of a differentiation really for between well there, there wasn't a stress on the separate role that women play the unique role that women play and i think that that should be stressed to a greater degree because when you see when you look at what happens in practice in the response to the crisis you can see once again that the role of women is a very strong one we can see women leading many of the initiatives and I think that's not necessarily to be taken for granted. It's something that we should stress and highlight. So from our side, what I can say is that the GSEF has been uh, helping to provide articulation, and I think this will continue happening as we move forward. And we're at the beginning of a very interesting process. We don't have much time. What we really have to do is to ensure that the new economy is a broad uh, response. Thank you very to the much. Crisis. I think the integration of SSE into a broad framework of development at the local level and national level has been extremely uh, important point for every actor in SSE community. And I think that has been emphasized in our guidelines as well in terms of policy tools and institutions. So I think we are closing to that guideline presentation, but we need a toilet break. So uh, I will give you five minutes and I strongly recommend you to go to the toilet and come back with your lunch, dinner or night snack, depending on where you are. Because uh, in Geneva, it is almost eight o'clock, or no, eight, seven past eight. And uh, it's very early in the morning in, the, in Korea and in the Latin America, it must be kind of lunchtime. So I will give you five minutes to get uh, to address these two issues, toilet and food. Okay, we will resume in five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I asked you to bring your food with you and uh, Margie brought her computer to the kitchen. <laughs> I brought my banana and potato here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I mean, we still have almost same number of people attending this conference. At the beginning. I think it shows the kind of importance of this discussion for everybody. And now we enter the last session uh, discussing yeah, guidance for yeah. governments. You know, all those seven case studies became the basis of these guidelines because we uh, gathered information and knowledge lessons from those seven case studies and other literature to make these guidelines. And we talked about all those important issues in policies like a legal framework, uh, co-production process or co-construction process, capacity building, development planning, and all those elements are in these guidelines. So we will go for this guideline presentation by Hamish Jenkins, my colleague in our team. And Samuel, could you play pre-recorded presentation of Hamish? Hello. Hello, uh, friends, colleagues and uh, partners from all over the world. Uh, it's my honor to present a research project that uh, UNRIST has undertaken with uh, the help of uh, GSEF. My name is uh, Hamish Jenkins. I'm a consultant uh, 
for this project, which has lasted about a year to, to, to bring all these elements together for guidelines on the promotion of uh, public policies for, for SAC. And uh, it is my um, honor to present the initial findings of, of, of this research, which is aimed really to, to provide practical guidance to um, policymakers, primarily at the, at the local level. So the aim of these guidelines is, as I said, to provide practical guidance to policymakers primarily at the subnational level to develop and consolidate public policies to enable actors within the social and solidarity economy to establish themselves, grow and prosper for the common good within their respective territory. Um, why, why did we um, undertake this endeavor? One of the strategic reasons is that SSC is a means of implementation of the UN uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, which applies to all the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted during the 2015 UN Sustainable uh, Development Summit. Um, this has to be placed within a broader context that there are political difficulties uh, of long-standing macroeconomic um, transformations that are needed to, to, to realize the, the 2015 agenda. But regardless of whether or when they can be achieved, it is imperative that they be complemented by what one can describe as a bottom-up process of socio-economic and political transformation at the local level to meet these objectives. And um, the social and solidarity economy can be a key vehicle towards this end. So what, what is the social and solidarity economy, SSE? Well, in fact, there is no uniform definition of SSC, in part because of its diversity of actors and territorial experiences. For the purposes of this presentation and of this publication, the following definition is used, which is contained in, in these draft guidelines. Uh, and it, follows as such. SSC encompasses organizations and enterprises with social and often environmental objectives guided by principles and practices of cooperation, solidarity, and dem democratic self-management where decision-making power is not, and, and we insist on this point, is not linked to the weight of held capital. This is the great difference with the conventional uh, economic model. Organizations, relations, and activities that adhere to these distinctive principles are greatly varied. Uh, existing laws on SSE in its various forms apply to a wide range of organizations and enterprises and these can include cooperatives, non-profit organizations, associations engaged in economic activity, mutuals, which are often uh, formed to organize finance-related activities, foundations, and enterprises which prioritize social and environmental goals well over profit. One of the great 
stepping stones towards this agenda was the formation of the United Nations Task Force on SSC, which Il Chong has already uh, alluded to in his uh, previous presentation. And it's worth just reminding everyone that a wide coalition of United Nations organizations, pl plurilateral bodies such as the European Commission, the OECD, and um, a wide diversity of global SSC civil society networks got together and joined forces to advocate for the SSC as an essential um, transformational agenda to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal. Once uh, we have managed to establish SSC as a global agenda for, 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 for the transformation of uh, economic systems, one needs to move to uh, a practical concrete agenda in order to scale up SSC. And in this context, unrest with the financial support and guidance of uh, GSEV, uh, spent about a year to produce a comprehensive set of public policy guidelines to advance the SSE agenda. For readers, these guidelines for local governments primarily are intended to, to foster a clearer understanding of the major principles, values, organizational features and trans transformative potentials of SSC. The target readers include not only uh, government officials, but also SSC practitioners, of course, scholars, and other stakeholders with an interest in promoting SSC through public policies and institutions particularly in the local context. In this um, primary version, open for consultation during the October virtual GSEF uh, forum, the guidelines cover the following nine complementary public policy angles that need to be ideally advanced in concert to genuinely scale up and sustain local SSC ecosystems, which is an expression that describes a range of uh, institutions that work in parallel organizations, uh, networks, and uh, of course, uh, government um, organizations that take into account the diverse socio-economic, political, and cultural context within their territories. They are detailed in distinct chapters in this um, publication as follows. So the chapters are organized in the following order. In the first instance, uh, co-construction for public policy for SSC is absolutely essential. Um, and this, this publication provides guidance on how to establish and manage diverse processes and a wide range of mechanisms and approaches to co-construction of public policies and plans between government and SSC actors. The second chapter focuses on another essential element, which is legal frameworks for SSC. This introduces various legal institutions that regulate and support SSC at international, supranational, national, but essentially subnational, 
meaning regional, provincial, and municipal levels, and explains different pathways to creating them. The third chapter looks at the issue of mainstreaming SSC and development plans, meaning the overall framework within which uh, different institutions, financial institutions and so forth can operate to actually um, vitalize uh, this, this movement. This explains how to incorporate SSC in development and programs that different levels of government can establish SSE-specific development plans and programs. The fourth chapter looks at supporting organizations for SSE. This dem demonstrates different trajectories of development of supporting organizations for SSE, uh, and these can include government organizations with specific ma mandates to support SSE, intermediary organizations engaged in co-construction of policies and their implementation, as well as uh, SSE networks and associations working across the jurisdictions of cities, regions, and provinces. Uh, the fifth chapter focuses on capacity building for SEC. This introduces and explains several public policies and institutions for capacity building and training services on management, governments, uh, and other functions to empower and enable uh, social and solidarity enterprises and organizations to become more efficient and sustain sustainable in the market economy and more relevant and impactful for their communities. The sixth element is access to finance, which is also extremely central. And uh, this chapter illustrates uh, various public policy measures to facilitate the access of SSC uh, to both public and private finance for different stages of SSC development, including social and solidarity finance, private and public loans, state subsidies and grants, private donations, and more innovative uh, instruments such as social impact bonds and complementary currencies. Seventh, Seventh uh, chapter is on uh, access to markets for SSC. Uh, this chapter explains the series of processes such as purchase, supply, and consumption of SSC goods and services in both public and uh, uh, private um, uh, markets and outlines the ways in which uh, one can basically, from an SSC pers perspective, access both those types of markets, which are quite different, and which we detail in, in the uh, in the chapter in question. On the eighth uh, chapter, we look at one area that is quite uh, crucial, which is SSC communication, uh, a communication strategy which outlines various public policies for awareness raising, 
uh, campaigns, advocacy strategies to inform individual and groups, uh, to uh, become aware of the value and the, 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 the extraordinary potential of, of SSE, even though it is uh, quite a challenge to, to communicate. The ninth chapter looks at uh, map, mapping the social and solidarity economy as a whole, looking at the a very diverse range of uh, organizations and enterprises that often fall under the the radar screen. So uh, it is basically research and data collection for SSE and policy approaches on how to promote research collection and data processing and the transfer of knowledge and lessons on SSE. And on this front, one of the big difficulties is, of course, that many of the SSEOs are under the, under the radar screen. They're often part of the informal sector. And therefore, uh, there, there is a need for very creative means to try and find ways in which to identify these organizations that are in the informal sector, but play a vital role in the development of this overall movement. So, so uh, each of these chapters are illustrated with examples drawn especially from the seven case studies that were commissioned by UNRIST as an integral part of this project on SSC public policy experience of city and provincial governments from uh, the following territories. Number one, Barcelona, then Dakar, Durban, Liverpool, Mexico City, Seoul, Quebec and Montreal, and these were framed within the context of uh, emerging policy analysis and academic uh, research on the SSC. So uh, while the chapters are conceived to be read independently from each other, the topics are evidently all interconnected and therefore every chapter has a guidance section with a flowchart of questions and answers which will guide respondents to relevant information that can be found in uh, some of the other chapters. The questions are designed to draw out respondents perceptions and complement this with strategic investigations of the context they are working in so that they can establish what processes are needed to improve current policies and institutions for SSE, communicate with uh, one another, document uh, institutions and policies in question, and help them to plan their respective actions. That is the, the, the final chapter of, uh, of this current uh, publication. And uh, to conclude, there are a range of cross-cutting themes that reappear across this draft document. And these include, number one, the essential need for policy co-construction between the public sector and SSE actors to ensure that the policies developed correspond to the real needs and conditions on the ground. This process of continuous policy dialogue needs to be undertaken as an indispensable investment to avoid the risk of policy failure 
and consequent squandering of resources. Secondly, the essential need for long-term political con continuity between policy cycles, as one would say, meaning if there's a change of of, of government with a different uh, political party uh, that might terminate what was initiated by the previous government. And, and one of the ways is to achieve this through uh, legal institutionalization or, as one would say, a legal lock-in of SSC policy into uh, laws that in some contexts, such as Brazil, can be undertaken at a subnational level and enable SSC policy to continue even if at the federal level um, the um, federal initiatives have been completely uh, dismantled, but also uh, aiming to, to try and get a buy-in on the socio-economic benefits of SSC across different political parties, meaning that uh, SSC is an entrepreneurial spirit which can be embraced from all sides of the political spectrum. Thirdly, there is a, a challenge for subnational policymakers to know through which angle to integrate and mainstream SSC in the wider sustainable development plans. And this varies enormously from one legal and constitutional context to another. In some cases, these can be undertaken autonomously at the sub-national level, as in the case of um, Seoul in South Korea. In other more federally centered contexts, it requires coordination uh, with the national government. And um, in, um, in the ideal situation, it would be through a cross ministerial strategy uh, to plug SSC uh, in all the relative uh, departments, whether health, agriculture, forestry, education, or other relevant sectors. Um, it is a complicated process to navigate across a wide variety of ju jurisdictions, but this publication aims to help policymakers to navigate through these different options in function of their So to conclude, uh, we need to look at uh, various pathways to t uh, attempt to test the value of these recommendations in, in concrete terms. And for this, we have different uh, institutional options to go forward. We have, of course, uh, uh, a project that's still underway within the, the UN Task Force on SSC to link uh, ways in which one can promote SSC in concrete terms for the implementation of the SS SDG agenda. Uh, we have the the UNDP Local Economic Development Program called uh, UNDP Art, which has already shown great interest in integrating SSC as part of a local economic development strategy in various countries. We have the UCLG, uh, the United Cities and Local Governments, that are committed now to, to also bring in SSC as part of their overall uh, strategic framework. And uh, GCEF, of course, which has training courses around the world, 
within which uh, these guidelines could be tested and integrated. And uh, finally, we also have the OECD in cooperation with the Euro European Commission, who are developing a major program to promote SSE within their budget. Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, first of all, I mean, the, you can uh, have a look at this uh, consultation document of guidelines. Uh, we provided link in the chat box and, uh, and there is a link in the website of uh, UNMIST and uh, GSAP as well. So I uh, strongly encourage you to have a look at it and give us feedback on the draft consultation document. And we will incorporate those comments into final version of guidelines. And I can say with confidence that there is no single answer to policy questions. We cannot say you should do this, you should do that to uh, deal with a specific question in your local areas. So these guidelines uh, is not about what you should do to promote SSE in your local context. It is about the lessons, findings you can uh, refer to when you are trying to establish policies and institutions to promote SSE in your local context. That means you have to adapt all those information and knowledge you can get from this uh, guideline to your local context. So um, it is not enough to uh, you know, explain all these substance and important points of guidelines within 30 minutes. But I think you know, Hamish was successfully describing all those important points and elements of guidelines. So uh, let's have some comments from two invited uh, policymaker at the local level. I'd like to call upon um, Maud uh, Maki Bissonnet, uh, the Madam Councillor, Gatineau City, Canada. First, floor is yours, Maud uh, Maki Bissonnet. Hello, can you hear yes. me well? Yes. Great. Uh, well, uh, first, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm glad to be here again. I was in Bilbao two years ago, uh, and I'm very glad to have those discussions uh, with you again this year. Uh, the city of Gatineau is just about to officially adopt its social economy policy. Uh, in fact, it should be tomorrow at the Municipal Council, uh, and we have worked in the recent months on this policy. Uh, we've been accompanied by Nancy Nimtam, who was uh, early a panelist as well, and it was a, a, a great process. Um, so I want to reflect on what has been discussed earlier uh, and what has been uh, documented in the research that I had the occasion to read uh, before uh, and stress some points that uh, were told today, but also that uh, could resonate uh, as Gatineau is about to adopt uh, our policy. Um, it, as for context, uh, I feel like uh, uh, social economy uh, is uh, gaining more and more importance. Uh, Margie Mendel and Nancy mm -hmm. discussed that earlier, but we have uh, a, a situation in, in Canada at least, but I believe it's across uh, the world uh, probably, uh, where cities are uh, gaining uh, more and more importance. They are uh, having more and more responsibilities and resources are uh, very limited. Um, in that context, uh, social economy uh, has some uh, a role uh, to play. Uh, also, and it was mentioned clearly in the in the in the research, the widespread uh, reduction of fiscal transfer to municipalities. Uh, I find it very accurate for us here. Um, the role of uh, well, everything that is related to climate change and sustainable development, as well as fighting growing economic and social inequalities. Uh, I want to underline few principles of social economy. Uh, first one is subsidiarity. Uh, so taking making decision as close as the citizen as possible, equality and justice, sustainable development, as I mentioned. Also, I, I really like the 
expression and, and it was the first time I was coming across it, people centered from uh, uh, UNRISD um, and also uh, democratic power and it might be something that we tend to forget in at least in my in my country in Quebec uh, but uh, we might sometimes underestimate the value of it but it's really at the at the center of what we're doing so if I try to answer the question how to transfer transform the present and build a better future from the perspective of SSE um, and trying to stress some some uh, few elements uh, of course we need uh, enabling policies and the appropriate funding for it um, what I find can be counterintuitive for public admin is, in general is that they have to let it go a bit with social economy. Uh, public structure tend to have uh, some PAD dependency, what we call PAD dependency, so just to reproduce the model that we already are using and just to uh, do the same thing that we're uh, used to do. Um, and they're not always open to innovation and social economy is innovation by definition. Uh, and it is the case for the process as much as the result. Uh, so this is a challenge and something that we have, uh, I believe, to keep in mind. Um, also, the fact that is uh, social ec economy must be placed based policies, they must be uh, decentralized as well. Uh, Many of us mention many of the of the people present today mentioned the importance of uh, the level of government working together to create enabling environment that is part of it as well. Uh, but it should not be top down, but really much like bottom up uh, when it's time to uh, develop local policies to enable a social economy. And also uh, policies must be comprehensive uh, and it challenges the, administra the administrative silos. Um, and it's something that we have to address as well, but is also a bit counterintuitive for public administration. Something else, and I believe Nancy and Nimtam will probably smile when I will say that, uh, but I believe that it's important that political and administrative uh, both sides have the will to uh, go in that direction. Uh, and this is something we've been uh, through with uh, the city of Gatineau. Uh, but for the success of uh, uh, SSC policy, we need to make sure, and this is maybe something that I haven't seen in the research uh, that could be added, I might, if I might suggest. But there's, um, there's uh, something here, because sometimes what we see in Gatineau is there is a strong political will, but the administration the administrative machine doesn't follow, maybe is not ready to follow as much. Uh, it's a change of culture for them uh, because they need to let the power go to the community. Um, and it's, uh, it's, of course, a challenge for public and I believe in general. And there's the importance as well of what we've mentioned today about co-construction and collaborative process as well. Uh, and just one last element before I, uh, I end up today, uh, and this has been uh, very in evident in the chapter uh, developed by, or the, the paper developed by uh, the Barcelona team, uh, but we need to have evidence-based policy, uh, also data, and uh, of course, network of practitioners and experts are very helpful, I believe, for the success of social uh, economy policies. Uh, and as a researcher, of course, I tend to believe in those things in general, uh, but I find uh, the occasion to discuss and to learn about other cases very useful when it comes to create uh, policies and environment to uh, consolidate the social economy. So I hope it's helpful, but thank you again. Thank you very much, especially um, you touched upon that issue of uh, kind of built-in resistance in bureaucracy and administration. I think you know, we have some answers or lessons about those issues in our guidelines, uh, you know, in communication chapters or capacity building and all that. So maybe you can have a look at those chapters dealing with those culture, cultural issues related to policy reform or policy reasons uh, in local context. And I will move on to um, Ronald uh, Nubuga Parimwezo, uh, mayor of Nakawa Division. Kampala City, Uganda. Donald, are you with us still? Yes, I'm with you. Yeah. Good morning, good evening. My name is Ronald Balimwezo, the mayor of Nakawa Division. First and foremost, I would like to thank UCF for giving me the opportunity 
to be on this platform. I would also like to thank UNRISD for the great opportunity. Yes, I do agree with uh, almost all <clears throat> the policy guidelines given by Jenkins. It was a very good research, but uh, I feel like uh, a few things were left out. To me, I believe that uh, we should have a policy guideline on innovation. Like we have seen recently during the COVID, we had quite a number of challenges and we needed to new ideas, particularly to, 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 to fight the COVID uh, viruses. And uh, that required us to basically to have a policy on, uh, on innovation, new ideas. Then I also think that we needed a policy on inclusiveness. Uh, in Uganda, at least it has been uh, a little brought out clearly that uh, government of Uganda uh, is against uh, bias on uh, gender. So anyone who, who is not gender sensitive, uh, government does not usually support them. And therefore we need uh, a policy on inclusiveness. I also think that it is important to have uh, a policy on uh, procurement. Procurement, it is very, very vital. And um, management, majority of our S SSEs have uh, basically collapsed because of poor management. And uh, I believe that if we provided a, a policy guideline on, the, on management of SSEs, it would uh, create a good ambience. SSEs is a vehicle uh, to solve many of uh, the national and local government uh, challenges, which basically include unemployment. And therefore, I agree that we need uh, a very good environment for them to thrive. Here in Uganda, we have uh, quite a number of challenges, some of which are political to the extent of uh, government putting in place hard, expensive and bureaucratic uh, procedures for SSEs to, to grow. And as you know, that majority of our SSEs are informal and therefore of vulnerable people, it's hard for them to register, for them to, to, be, to become formal. Therefore, we need uh, a policy towards that. And we need government will, basically, government, particularly during this time, political month, political year, they are very, very worried of even fi financing uh, SSEs. So we have a very big challenge. I, I pray that um, you help us on uh, giving us ideas on what we can do for that challenge of uh, political will. With those few remarks, I want to appreciate all of you for the great opportunity. But I also think that since the greatest challenges are with uh, the least developed countries, this research would have given uh, those least developed countries a chance other than giving Dakar only. Because when you look at the GDP of these countries, you find out that uh, majority of them, their GDP is very, very, very big compared to Dakar. So because, um, uh, SSEs are basically targeting to improve uh, the quality of uh, the vulnerable people. I would believe that uh, would uh, uh, would uh, put more 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 vulnerable countries in this research. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Thank you very much, Ronald. Um, I, I really appreciate your comments and remarks about several points. You think very which are very important uh, because those remarks are kind of vindicated our positions or emphasis on those points about innovative ideas and uh, procurement process and uh, the management issues of SSE because they are presented in our guidelines uh, in very much detail. So I strongly recommend you to look at those chapters dealing with innovative ideas in communication, financing, and market strategies, and uh, the procurement process in financing chapter, 
and other chapters and management issues in capacity building. And uh, on another front, I mean, you emphasize the importance of giving more chances to uh, developing countries in terms of research. I think that is also in line with our strategy to produce uh, version 2.0, uh, including more case studies on developing countries. So thank you very much for uh, the remarks. And I will open the floor. We do not have much time, but I think we have around um, 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, raise your hand or uh, write down your comments or questions in chat box and I will pick up and uh, we can discuss. Uh, is there any? I cannot see a uh, raised hand. So uh, maybe we can go back to the presentation. Margie has a comment. Yeah, Margie, okay. Okay, I apologize. I, I couldn't find the little blue hand, it, it, it disappeared. <clears throat> Just a, com a, a quick comment. Um, first of all, bravo, uh, Hamish, it's a very, uh, it, your presentation was excellent and I really look forward to reading the, the report. Um, apropos some of the comments that were made um, and I'd like to draw on Maud, um, Maud's comments from Gatino. Uh, and I think we mentioned it and I don't remember if we mentioned it in the plenary this morning or in, in this session. But the, the paradox of the celebration of the innovation that social and solidarity economy represents, uh, and then within the institutions that are, um, you know, mandated to support them, uh, whether it's municipal or regional or, or national government, but right now we're focusing on municipal, there are barriers, and those are cultural barriers and institutional barriers. So I think that this is, it, it's not up to the social and solidarity economy to transform the in, institutional infrastructure of municipal administration. But on the other hand, we have enough illustrations to show that working across these boundaries, working horizontally and creating stakeholder spaces uh, for ongoing dialogue is, is key. It's not going to happen any other way because the social and solidarity economy is not the third sector. It isn't sectoral. It is cross-sectoral. Uh, it cuts across all uh, divisions of government at, at all levels. So I, I think that this is something, we had a little experience of this in, in Canada, not just Quebec, when we had a one year of a government um, that recognized the need to do that and actually created a space for the social and solidarity economy, including actors. Unfortunately, that government fell within a year and this was not uh, pursued. But th this is a big, a big challenge is to move beyond uh, siloed um, uh, approaches uh, to the social and solidarity economy. The other thing I just wanted to raise, and I, I, I guess it's a comment really to the research that Hamish did, and we can go back to that at another time. So I just want to flag it. Um, I'm not a big fan of social impact bonds, and I think we need to discuss this. But on the other hand, if we're working at the municipal level, we've got uh, illustrations that are historic, uh, municipal bonds. Uh, in Quebec now, we have uh, community bonds. There are, are green bonds. Uh, because the, the way in which social impact bonds have evolved is very top down, but I will, I will park that um, for a moment. Um, and like to just really emphasize the need on horizontality and stakeholder participation. Thank you very much. We will collect the questions first and then we will go back to Hamish and other team members like uh, Samuel and me. Okay, I see Roberto. Roberto? Roberto, yes? You can unmute your microphone first. Listo. Yo quisiera poner énfasis en... Well, I would like to place the emphasis on two or three things which I think are fundamental. The first of these is that there are different territories, different local areas, and the dynamics of building a social and solidarity economy are completely different from one place to the next. And they give a completely different discourse or a different explanation, a different approach to SSE. In Mexico in particular, in our area, we have 
we had to find the right political conditions, very specific conditions, so that the law could actually be implemented. Uh, otherwise, it would have been left, it would have been ignored, it would have been just left on the shelf because the authorities showed no interest in working on it. So we need, we, efforts had been made for decades. The most vulnerable sectors had been seeking out the best way to survive and the way to overcome marginal, marginalization. Therefore, uh, solidarity is fundamental. And then if we look at Latin America in general, I can see that we can see that the issue of consolidating uh, self-managed organizations is really moving forward. This uh, helps to create visibility. And so we can see two very different dynamics going on. There is solidarity. There is the issue of freedom and many other pr principles in SSE, they take very, a very different form in Latin America. We have experiences with our, municipal, our municipality in this particular area, and we had to prove to them what we were able to do with the social and solidarity economy so that the government would open up to us, so that they would call upon us, so that they would come to us, and so that they would work with us. But we had to prove it beforehand. We had to prove it ourselves. And so self-management and the strength of organizations of the social and solidarity economy, I believe that is fundamental. It is uh, primordial. It is essential. And uh, analyzing the political landscape is something that cannot be forgotten about. It's something that we really need. And another thing is talking about in SSE in Canada, in Spain, it's, oh, it's completely different in each area. France, it's completely different. Uh, and I think we really need to understand that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. And is there any other questions or comments? Yes, there is by Leslie Huckfield. Okay, Leslie, uh, thank you very much for joining us. You have to unmute your microphone first. Okay. I'm usually I'm usually told to mute. Um, <laughs> can I just can I just say um, uh, for those of us in um, academia in Scotland and I I work at Glasgow Caledonian University. This is all this is all very encouraging, very very encouraging. Um, I don't know how many colleagues participated in the event this afternoon, but there were in fact 750 participants at one stage this afternoon. And since that was a genuinely global audience, first of all, I find, I find the process and the mechanisms and the ability to convene that kind of an audience very, very encouraging. But what was being said, many of us found even more encouraging. So congratulations for all of those who've been involved in the organizing. Let me just be a tiny bit controversial. Um, Though obviously I support and would like to encourage the guidelines which are being developed, I think we need to recognise that we don't actually uh, participate in all of this in a politically neutral context. We've got, some, we've got some forces which haven't been mentioned very often this afternoon and this evening, which spend a lot of time working very much against us. Um, I'm talking about, and Margie mentioned this um, uh, some time ago, we're talking about those who want to develop social impact bonds, we're talking those who, who want to develop social investment, impact investment, and all of this is nothing but a covert ploy to get more private capital into what we're trying to do. I have to say that it's a, it's a source of great regret for me that a lot of this comes from London. A lot of this comes from London. It comes from the British Council, it comes from the UK big accountancy firms, PricewaterhouseCooper, KPMG, Ernst & Young, are pumping out this stuff all the time. And of course, they will be on our side because they see us as an opportunity of making business. So um, I have to say that while I, while I welcome every single thing that's taking place, I think we need really to take heed of the fact that particularly during COVID, um, the other side, and I'm talking about international, multinational corporate capitalism, hasn't exactly gone to sleep. 
It's, 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 it's working on every single opportunity it can find. But perhaps the most encouraging thing to come out of these sessions that we've had so far are the sort of local state examples that obviously Alan was talking about in Liverpool. Um, we had some examples from Barcelona. We've had some um, examples, obviously, from Quebec, which many of us have always found I I inspiring, always found inspiring. When Scotland, when Scotland becomes independent, by the way, which is not very long to wait, <laughs> um, I hope that much of what takes place in Scotland will be modelled on Quebec. So, um, yes, we have some local state examples, and I think we ought to be working more and more on how we can multiply, how we can support, how we can legislate, how we can plan and prepare for those local state examples. And I don't apologise. I hope that those local state examples will help us in the fight against international multinational corporations because they are not on our side. Thank you very much. I think the, that, that is one of the whole ideas behind this project. I mean, the, I like Gramsci's uh, kind of explanation about how to fight the capitalism or the powerful. I mean, it's a trench war, right? We have to entrench or we have to reinforce our trenches first. And I think this guideline is going to reinforce our effort to establish policies and institutions for SSE. And that is the best way to fight kind of a unruly capitalism or international corporatism uh, or businesses. I think the, uh, there are, there must be some other ways, but I think, you know, the first step towards the kind of, a, you know, winning the war against uh, unruly capitalism is going to be uh, uh, reinforcing our policy efforts to promote SSE in our localities. And I will go back to Hamish, uh, you know, uh, to answer those questions and comments. I think uh, maybe um, Samuel or I can intervene uh, after Hamish's responses to those questions if it is needed. Hamish, floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for my presentation because I was uh, a bit under the weather when I pre-recorded this thing and I hope it was just a flu and not uh, uh, something more serious like the COVID thingy. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm feeling a bit better today and I would like to start with uh, the, the comments by uh, the Honorable Mayor of Kampala. And I think her po his points were absolutely essential. And I think uh, Il Chong largely uh, responded to, to them, but I'd like just to, to emphasize a point that he made in an earlier remark about the fact that uh, uh, in developing countries, the informal economy is largely invisible. And, and this is really, I think one of the the next big challenges uh, to, to, to actually tackle, which is to uh, understand why um, a large majority of, of organizations uh, or associations of, of, of people who work on SSC prefer not to, not to be on the, the radar screen <laughs> of uh, the official administration, because then they will face all sorts of difficulties in terms of taxes and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, one, one should try and find a way to, 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 to bring visibility to what they're doing in a way that doesn't actually then fall down on them as a, you know, um, new, 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 administrative hassles that uh, they don't want to face. So in the, we, we looked quite closely at the, the case of Brazil. And what we found is that um, a large majority of um, <clears throat> informal actors either decide to stay in the informal economy and then the only way to find out about their existence is through what we call a snowball uh, mythology of trying to uh, find people who know people, etc. And then they, they build up a, a, a larger 
repertoire of uh, who are these actors. But those who decide to, to go into registration, they usually choose uh, associations and uh, sometimes enterprises, but then there are also difficulties there. So there are lots of adm administrative hurdles to actually figure out how to both support, but also um, identify who these actors are, who are under the um, radar screen. And I agree with you. I mean, this, this as Il Chung said, this was the first go. We had limited resources. And uh, it's true that the majority of the case studies were in uh, relatively resource-rich countries, uh, with a few exceptions like Dakar and to some extent uh, Durban. Uh, but uh, really, the the next step is is to delve into this question of working with with the the, the countries that have um, enormous potential but are you know, under-resourced and um, in, that, in that context, the tricky situation is to see how one can both um, activate the, the, the international development uh, agenda around SSE, which to some extent, uh, it didn't came out, come out uh, so much in the Dakar presentation, but there are international development agencies that are supporting Senegal on, on SSE and uh, other countries, but it's, it's still not uh, up to speed. But at the same time, it, the trick is how, how does one make sure that uh, the SSE agenda doesn't uh, become completely dependent on uh, international development aid and that this aid is really aimed at creating um, a, a process of self-sufficiency, which is, uh, a, a, if we bring it down to the national and subnational level, it's the same thing. How can SSC organizations benefit from uh, external support, but gradually become self-sufficient? Hello? Um, the, the, the second point that uh, the Honorable Mayor of Kampala mentioned was public procurement. Uh, I mean, that, that, that is a strategic um, angle which we tackle in, in the chapter on access to uh, public and private markets. And there are a whole set of options for uh, really activating the public procurement option um, to, to scale up SSE. The, the third uh, point is, um, I think this was raised from our friends from Quebec, is on social bonds. Um, <clears throat> I must say, uh, from a personal level, I'm as skeptical as, uh, as you on, on the social bonds, depending on, on how they put in place. <laughs> we, we put that in as... as uh, as an option, but it would be very interesting to see how one can avoid the, um, you know, the, the downsides that uh, this this option provides, which is also linked to the whole question of uh, uh, social impact investment. Which, if you read the document, where we, you know, we outline the uh, the schemes, but are also uh, quite skeptical and, and um, show all the downsides that could happen. And it really depends on context. So your feedback on how to make sure that, you know, social bonds approaches are, are sustainable and not um, a manipulation would be very useful. On the question of um, political trends, local versus national, and global, well, then I, I fully support what um, Il Chung said about 
very much using SSC, especially in this context of the, the COVID-19, where we have to basically consolidate local ways of, of uh, producing and exchanging and consuming is perhaps, you know, um, a blessing in, in disguise in, in, in the sense that it'll inevitably, inevitably force a localization of uh, uh, local economic circuits. And then uh, as a final point, I would, I would like to explore ways in which uh, this, this local bottom-up uh, SSE agenda can tail in with um, the, the numerous calls for a, a global Green New Deal, which involves major macroeconomic changes, et cetera, but cannot and will not function if, it, if it's not driven from a, a bottom-up uh, perspective through uh, uh, local SSC development. So, you know, if we think of a 2.0, I would like to look at ways in which, you know, we can look at more uh, macroeconomic levels of, of this agenda in a way that connects with SSC uh, around this, this uh, global Green New Deal, which in, in one form or another will have to <laughs> come into existence if we want to survive. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this guidelines is a collective effort. A lot of people have been involved in making this possible. And obviously uh, it was written by a group of authors uh, you know, headed by uh, Hamish Jenkins as a lead author, but we have another members like uh, uh, Samuel Bueli Sauer. Uh, I'd like to have a comment or any any intervention from Samuel uh, on those questions or comments raised by our participants. Samuel, floor is yours. Um, well, I think um, we are definitely in a in a timely phase now with this guideline with these guidelines, right? So we do have a a situation where many policies are being questioned uh, given this, this very particular circumstances with the COVID crisis. And um, we definitely do have uh, relatively hands-on instructions that uh, governments, that local governments and policymakers around the world can use now in this very, in this very particular moment of, of building back better or whatever terminology we want to use for that. Um, but I think uh, this is very, this is this is really a, a timely discussion that we're having now and to see that still after three and a half hours of presentation still 90 people are here this is a uh, great to observe i'm very very thankful for everybody who joined today for all your very valuable inputs that we're going to consider um i think il chong and hamish and i will definitely listen to this whole discussion uh, tomorrow towards the end of the week and uh, and are really uh, looking forward to soon uh, provide you or like to publish the revised version of the guidelines as well and to all have you on board also for the ongoing um, process as we as we keep uh, talking and uh, writing about public policies for for uh, the promotion of the SSE. Um, so from my side really a great thanks to you all for the for writing these uh, very valuable case studies and for uh, for for giving us your very valuable inputs and I think this is a, a great basis for keep the, for us to keep going our work on, on these public policy guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a long session from the beginning to the end, and now we are close to the end. Um, you know, this is just first step to produce these guidelines. So we need your support, feedback, comments, questions, which can uh, you know improve the quality of guidelines. So please give us feedback and comments and questions on these uh, guidelines uh, within a week. We do not have much time though, so uh, it should be within a week. Uh, and um, uh, on behalf of UNRIS research team, I'd like to thank uh, all those support from GSEP, Global Social Economy Forum, uh, Lawrence Kwak and Aram Kim, Martin Ho, and all those staffs of uh, GSEP. I mean, the, throughout the project, 
they've been uh, very much resourceful and uh, supportive of our efforts and they, they were very much helpful. And without their uh, support and help, uh, it could have been uh, impossible to make this guideline. And uh, lastly, I, I'd like to thank you all. As uh, Samia mentioned, I mean, I never seen this kind of, uh, you know, same number of participants, uh, which I saw uh, at the beginning of this session at the end. So I really thank you uh, for all your participation and patience about kind of hiccups of the uh, process of this session. And I look forward to your uh, comments and questions and they, we will keep in touch uh, in many ways. And I hope you and all you care about are safe and healthy in this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much. We better stop now. Thank you. Bye-bye.